time you want. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. This formal meeting of the Board of Education for May 19, 2014 is called to order. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone present and to our television viewers. Any item that will be voted on this evening has been posted as required by state law. This meeting is being televised live and will be replayed through the next two weeks. Please check the board website for replay times. This meeting is also being streamed live on our PPS TV services website. Director Morton is not with us this evening. So at this time, um, we'll move to our first agenda item, which is one of the best things that we get to do every year, our valedictorian recognition. Hooray! Um, so tonight we'll meet the valedictorians from every one of our high schools. Um, Superintendent Smith, would you like to say a few words? Um, and again, I would just like to say congratulations to all of our, our valedictorians and welcome to all the families who are here to celebrate and for our TV viewing audience. We just had a wonderful reception um, celebrating and naming some of the accomplished accomplishments of this group of students uh, and we're going to get to hear some of their stories tonight so congratulations to all of you and welcome and we look forward to hearing from you tonight um, <clears throat> excuse me oh, more applause <laughs> so each valid uh, each valedictorian will come forward and state their name and the last student from each high school has been selected by the group to answer the question what in your years at Portland Public Schools has prepared you for your next steps? So, would we like to go ahead and start? Trip Goodall, who is our Director of High Schools. Thank you, it really is a great honor. We're gonna start off with the valedictorian from Alliance. Hi, um, my name is James Swinford. Uh, yeah, so I'm the valedictorian from Alliance. I didn't really expect it, but uh, <laughs> no, really, I didn't. I just found out during my IEP meeting. <laughs> um, but yeah, apparently I am. <laughs> Yay! A wonderful surprise. <laughs> yep. A very nice surprise. So, so, um, so can you tell us what uh, at PPS helped you on your steps to where you are today? Well, dealing, I, I learned how to effectively deal with stress. That is going to probably be the single biggest thing in my entire life. Um, it, I have had to deal with a lot of stress, like stress of changing schools, stress of, uh, well, stress of trying to uh, reconcile what I love to do with, with actually doing school. Um, <laughs> That was that was actually particularly hard for me, <laughs> um, and yeah, that that will that will stay with me for the rest of my life, even whether or not, uh, well, no matter what I do when I get out of college, because I do plan on going to college, um, no matter what I do at any point in my life, that will be an important thing. Just deal with stress effectively. Great, thank you, Jim. A valedictorian from Benson Polytech. Hello, everyone. My name is Valentin Sainz Lopez. And uh, in my years at Benson Polytech, I've learned from the countless nights of doing homework, studying for tests, uh, stressing out over whether I was going to get an A in a class or not. I've learned uh, determination how to cope with uh, you know, not having enough time to study, how to get it into my time schedule. And I've also learned organization, which has been key to me, and punctuality, along with maturity, which I'm positive is gonna help me in my later years as I go to Oregon State University.
And now the valedictorians from Cleveland High School. Hi, my name is Caroline Baber. My name is Corona Brown. May Graham. I went on book there by first night. Jewel Holgate. <laughs> Joel Hui. Scott Nyman. Brian Orozco. Grace Starr. Marianne Stites. Kate Toma Hilliard. Azalea Thompson. Amanda Oreck. Samantha Etke. Francesco Vernicatel. Oh. Antonia Washington. <laughs> Aaliyah Whitehill. <laughs> Emily Wynn. Oh. Tony Yen. My name is Brandon Orozco. I think many of us tend to believe we are born into or grow into certain situations. And for this example, we move, or we move to or grow up in a neighborhood that belongs to a certain school district. I think the opposite is true for PPS. PPS grows onto you, PPS grows with you. I can only speak on behalf of my PPS experience from being able to attend Atkins Elementary School, a school that boasts about its diversity and appreciation of diversity and has an amazing Spanish immersion program to being able to follow the immersion program until finally ending up at Cleveland which is known for its international baccalaureate program. Apart from awesome programs, I have encountered wonderful teachers and mentors. The idea of motivation and finding the right career has always been in my mind during PPS schooling. These teachers and faculty members, totally selfless individuals, do not work for the money. They are motivated by something else, and I'm sure it involves satisfaction of seeing a student progress through the system and achieving success or running towards it. I owe an infinite amount of debt to my teachers who have guided me along the way and the incredible programs I have privi been privileged with and have helped me prepare for, my, for the next steps. Thank you. And now the Franklin valedictorians. Hello, my name is uh, Alexander Fachuk. My name is Emma Irvin. My name is Jenny Zhu. My name is Joan Kim. I'm Julia Yu. My name is Lily Chen. My name is Rachel Geiger. My name is Sean Gehring. My name is Tian Nguyen. My name is Shawan Huang. My name is Yan Rong Chen. Hi, I'm, Fra uh, I'm Ryan from Franklin High School. And throughout my years at Portland Public Schools, I've grown up given so many opportunities. Starting at Atkinson Elementary, I started learning Spanish, or Chinese, I'm sorry, and at Mount Tabor, <laughs> well, I, d I learned both, actually, but <laughs> at Mount Tabor, I continued learning Spanish, and at Franklin, I was given the opportunity to take both Chinese and Spanish. Um, PPS has also given me so many opportunities, like taking 11 AP classes, participating in five sports, and learning woodworking at Franklin High School. For all these um, great things that I've learned, I'm so appreciative. Thank you, Portland Public Schools. Next, we have the valedictorians from Grant High School. 
Hey guys, I'm Nick Alvey. Uh, my name is Luke Atherton. I'm Piper Donahue. I'm Lydia Dernal. I'm Helena Klein. I'm Suzanne LaFleur. My name is Claire Leipzig. I'm Madeline Levin. My name is Allison Little. My name is Eleanor Neal. My name is Abby Nyland. My name is Sarah Onitska. Hi, I'm Christian Adair's Honor Powers. I am Kenny Regan. My name is Leah Robicho. I'm Ben Rosine. I'm Inya Van Buren. Hi, I'm Rachel Scheuermann. Jack Schrott. I'm Isaac Sensor. I'm Lane Williams. My name is Anya Wong Lifton. Hi, I'm Lily Lovett. Um, I'm a slam poet, so I told everyone I was going to slam this, but that's just not going to happen. Um, so starting way back in kindergarten, when I learned that 2 plus 2 equals 4, I also learned that I love math, and PPS has granted me the ability to take six years of high school math and given me the ability to pursue it in the future, and I am so thankful for that. Thank you. And now the valedictorians for Jefferson High School. <laughs> Michaela Johnson. <laughs> I'm Ashley Merriweather. And PPS has prepared me because I've learned the true definition of dedication and determination. I've, been able, I've had to do the long nights of studying and cramming and homework, and I know that that has prepared me for college, and I'm ready for what I'm going to have to do in college. And also the senior inquiry class that we have at Jefferson um, gives us a lot of college prep work, and I'm thankful for that. Thank you. The valedictorians for Lincoln High School. Hi, my name is Marty Berger. I'm Sydney Cookshaw. My name is Julia Eckelman. Hi, I'm Michael Field. My name is Juliet Foreman. Hi, I'm Georgia Diamond Gustafson. Hi, my name's Kendra Hong. My name is Robin J. as well. Hi, my name is Sierra Killian. Henry Kim. Hi, my name's Olnita Martini. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vicky New. My name is Michael Pauline. Andrew Tratner. Hi, my name is Alejandra Padinduja, and I would like to thank Portland Public Schools for teaching me about cultural competence. And I'm going to define that, just because it's a little bit difficult to explain, as knowing who you are with respect to the rest of the world and also being able to appreciate the beauty in other cultures. When I studied Spanish, French, and Arabic at Lincoln, 
I got to read philosophy in French. I got to read Garcia Marquez in Spanish. I got to read Arabic poetry. But my teachers always made sure to bring the curriculum back to what's currently happening in the Arab world, in West Africa, in Latin America, to make sure that we didn't treat all of these cultures and languages as ornaments, but rather as the identity of a unique people. So that's what I think Portland Public Schools for. And now the valedictorians for Madison High School. Hi, my name's Mei Se Chow. Adam Wright. Hi, my name is Vi Le. Hi, my name is Tandai. Hi, my name is Michael Larios, and I'll be representing Madison tonight. Through my years at PPS, PPS has presented me with a plethora of experiences and life lessons. One is that the backbone to any organization or group are the people who dedicate themselves and go beyond the call of duty. I mean, PPS has its flaws, it has made mistakes, but despite these flaws, the staff, the teachers, and the committee members have worked tirelessly to ensure that we have been presented with an opportunity to a decent education. And for them, I thank them. And also, another lesson I've learned is that to not the labels define me. Tonight, I feel like I've been invited to a party where I have no business being at. <laughs> Speaking, like, the reason I say this is because based on my race, my family's socioeconomic, you know, um, status, and also because the fact that I was born to immigrant parents, statistically speaking, I am not supposed to be here. But I thank the staff and the teachers in Madison for believing in me and making sure that I got the opportunity to better myself. And the last lesson I would like to discuss is one that I will hold dearly and I will remember forever. It's that it is our civil duty as part of our community to help those around us when we can. Behind each valedictorian, <laughs> behind each valedictorian here, there have been a series of mentors pushing us, strive, like making sure we strive for success. There are students at PPS who are struggling. They have the valedictorian potential, but they just need those mentors to push them to make them realize the greatness that they have inside of them. Just because we each are graduating here doesn't mean we can't come back and help out. That's one lesson I will take with me. Just because I'm graduating does not mean I can't come back and help. I've been presented with the opportunity, and look where I've come. I know other students can be up here as well. So thank you, PPS, for making me realize that. Thank you. And now the valedictorians for the Metropolitan Learning Center. Hi, hi I'm uh, Maddie Christman Miller. Hi, I'm Emily Villanueva. I'm Sarah Pyer Nelson. Hi, oh boy. Hi, I'm Zoe McWilliamson, and I had to write out my speech because I'm not so good at the memorization. So, um, I've been attending MLC since sixth grade. Um, MLC's unique atmosphere and approach to learning has provided me with opportunities to gain skills that are not traditionally emphasized in regular schools. Its small size has helped crea create bonds with incredible teachers, promoting self-advocacy and self-motivation. The K-12 atmosphere allows for cross-age interaction that sparks creativity and community. This year I spent one period every trimester in the kindergarten class at our school. I got credit by like being a role model for little kids and it was awesome. They're pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> my learning has gone so far beyond a textbook education and become something much bigger, something that, that has prepared me for not just college, but life as a whole. Now the valedictorian for Roosevelt High School. Hi, I'm Olivia LaMaster, and I'm Roosevelt. And through the 13 years that I've been at Portland Public Schools, I have learned how to manage my time. 
I've learned that I can do what I need to do and still do what I enjoy. I've been very involved in theater, in music, in art. I also have a job. So I've had to learn how to do everything and still continue my education and be proud of who I am. The valedictorians for Wilson High School. My name is Nicola Bachman. <laughs> I'm Jonah Harris. Hi, my name is Abby Malloy. Hey, I'm Kenny Noble. Good evening, my name is Liam Reese, and it is an honor to represent Wilson High School tonight. Um, I haven't really prepared a whole lot tonight, but I wanted to, to speak about an answer to the question, opportunities. And um, while we may be public schools, uh, Portland Public has provided all of us at Wilson and I'm sure at all the other schools in Portland Public with incredible opportunities. Um, I was asked to speak about some of these opportunities last year when I did an eighth grade uh, parent night. And, I was really proud because I got to say, in fact, I'm taking advantage of one opportunity tomorrow. I don't get to come to school because what I'm going to do instead is go to Microsoft and have a career day. And stuff like that, um, there are just so many opportunities that we've been given. And I'm incredibly grateful for, for, to have had these opportunities, to have experienced all these new things. And um, they've put me on the path that I'm on. And I couldn't be more grateful to have this education and to have these mentors. So thank you very much. If we could all just stand and, and give a real rousing applause for our valedictorians. Thank you, Superintendent Smith, board members. And thank you to all the valedictorians and also to all of those parents and guardians and mentors and teachers and administrators and coaches and all the other people that help these young people get where they are today. Thank you so much to all of you. You all deserve a hand as well. So we're going to take a two-minute break in order for the foyer to clear. Thank you. Okay, at this time, uh, Superintendent Smith, would you like to present the superintendent's report? Um, I would, and in honor of our uh, evening of recognizing valedictorians, I've invited Victoria New, who um, I will give you a little more explanation, but she's one of our valedictorians tonight, and she is going to do the presentation um, for my superintendent's report. So um, Vicki first came to my attention after being recognized by the National Center for Women and Information Technology in December. Um, the organization selected Vicki as one of 35 high school women from around the country for their award for aspirations in computing. And come on up, Vicki, and have a seat up here. After that, I learned from Bobby that Vicki had done a compelling um, speech at Forest Park on STEM education. So this is clearly a passion of hers and one that I wanted her to have the opportunity to speak to the board about. Um, her counselor, Danielle Holloway, said this about Vicki. Single -handed, Vicki single-handedly worked with the administration at Lincoln High School to develop four sessions of computer science courses as well as the very popular robotics courses for the school. She led the recruitment campaign to add six new first tech challenge robotics teams at Lincoln and has pioneered relationships with Portland State University so that Lincoln can have PSU graduates and postdoc mentors for its robotics team. In addition, Vicki's also a member of the Lincoln High School Constitution team, uh, which last month the team won the national championship in Washington, D.C. 
It's the fifth win for Lincoln and the sixth for Portland Public Schools, making us the first city in the country to do that. And finally, Vicki's chemistry teacher admits that Vicki is better at the subject than he is. She took the American <laughs> Chemical Society exam and got the highest score in the state. Her counselor said she's wicked smart, committed, and wholeheartedly throws herself into areas that interest her. Um, she's also a talented pianist uh, and is Lincoln High School's valedictorian. Vicki, welcome and thank you for being here with us tonight. So to uh, turn it over to you. I haven't always known what I want to do, but I've always known that I want to dedicate my life to helping those around me. I used to think that I would have to go into law, politics, or medicine in order to have a human impact on the world. But my freshman year of high school, you could say I found my calling. At the suggestion of my robotics coach, I took an online computer science class through a program called Udacity, which offers free online courses. I discovered that technology has a power to break down socioeconomic barriers in a way that no law can. I realized how empowering technological pr prowess could be, and I fell in love with the process of designing, implementing, and testing. Unfortunately, most high schoolers in the United States don't have the support that I did in pursuing technological interests. I've done robotics since the sixth grade, and both of my parents are employed in fields relating to science, technology, engineering, and math. In contrast, only 5% of, of high schools across the United States offer the advanced placement course in computer science, a number which has decreased 25% in the past 15 years. The U.S. Department of Labor estimates that in 2020 there will be 1.3 million job openings in technology, only half of which we're prepared to fill with current rates of graduates graduating with degrees related to technology. If we want our students to enter a workforce where they're in demand, we need our schools to be offering more in the way of computer science and engineering education. Not only are computer scientists generally have higher employment rates and higher salaries, but they also have skills which lend themselves to a wide variety of disciplines. Programming is more than just memorizing syntax or converting numbers from base 10 to binary. Fundamentally, computer science is about solving problems. It's about seeing a challenge and innovating a solution and then testing that solution. And this approach to life is something that's relevant in all fields. And the prevalence of technology today ensures jobs in sectors ranging from software development to medicine and finance. But the most important aspect of technology is that computers give individuals the power to change the world. Speaking from personal experience, I know that there's nothing more gratifying than seeing the tools that you've created help others impact their lives. This past summer, I was able to work on developing educational simulations that over 6,000 people have used to teach themselves about fractals in an online course run by Dr. Melanie Mitchell from Portland State University. The program I mentioned earlier, Udacity, has partnered with Georgia Tech to offer a master's in computer science for only $6,000 and also offers free courses to millions more. If we want to create effective solutions to the problems we face today, ranging from climate change to disease and wealth inequality, we need to harness the power of computers and the mindset of engineering. If we want to move forward with a diverse technological workforce, we need to encourage our students to get involved with technology early, and we need to do so in our schools. We need our students to learn computer science alongside biology, engineering, English, and mathematics so that they understand not only what technologies they're creating, but the implications of those technologies on a wide variety of disciplines. Ultimately, teaching computer science is not important so that our students are better employed or have higher salaries, but because with the populace well-versed in the most powerful technologies of today, we can have great hope for the tools of tomorrow. Thank you. Vicki, where are you going to school next year? I'm headed to Stanford. Congratulations. Thank Good you. for you. <laughs> yep. They are very lucky. <laughs> Any other questions for Vicki from uh, board members? I was just going to say, Bobby? I saw you present to a group of K through 5 students on STEM, and you gave a speech like that, but one that kids that right. age could grab onto, and you just excited them about STEM, and it was the most remarkable thing, and just watching you do that again was incredible. So Thank you. Stanford <laughs> really is lucky. Right. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. so much. Others? Tom? So uh, an online course got you all jazzed up. Um, do, do you think that 
we should do more, more of that in at PPS? I think that um, project-based learning is really important. So one of the things that's most unique about computer science is that it's incredibly accessible. So the course that I took, um, the basic outline of the course was centered on you building a search engine. So rather than teaching lectures and having you take notes, the first thing that we did in that course was to actually build something and to create it. And I think that's incredibly important. So that's why at Lincoln, we're pioneering robotics, which is completely project-based, so that students are learning the engineering process and engineering principles by building robots and seeing something tangible that they can interact with. And I think that stimulating that excitement and seeing something and seeing that you're making a real impact is really the best way um, to learn about engineering and technology and really all disciplines. So, so in that course, the, um, you communicated online with others in a project, essentially? Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent Smith, do you have anything else in your report? report. I wanted that opportunity. <laughs> I feel like it's, it was really important to end up hearing a student perspective about something that's been a deep discussion on, on part of the board, which is about STEM education, and this felt like our best messenger. I like the, the part uh, about it where you Vicki was talking about uh, hands-on learning because it's it, it is the CTE of mm -hmm. it's the wood shop of tomorrow I guess is what uh, makes me think of so thank you, thank you. okay um, we will now move on to our uh, student testimony Miss Houston are there any students signed up for student testimony there is not all those students here <laughs> okay <laughs> So then we'll move on to the student representative uh, report. Representative Davidson, would you like to go ahead and give your report and speak for all those students? I would, thank you. <laughs> there you go. Superintendent Smith and fellow board members, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. Tonight we'll be, we will be voting on the superintendent's uh, proposed budget. I think that especially on a night where we have heard from this year's valedictorians, it is important to reflect on what this budget means for the students of PBS. These valedictorians, despite their incredible achievements and worth ethics, have witnessed years of continued disinvestments in, dis in education. <coughs> this proposed budget does something that many of them never got to experience. It makes crucial investments in programs within PBS that I and my peers, including those who were previously standing before us, have never seen invested in. This budget is not a solution to the financial issues we face. There are still many programs that are drastically undersupported. But it is a bittersweet moment for me knowing that one of the last things I will do as a PPS student is vote on a larger budget than the previous year, a trend which has unfortunately become abnormal. When I started school in PPS in the fall of 1999, I wish I had been able to see the district moving in the direction I see it moving in today. However, I'm also hopeful that we will continue moving in this direction, not in inches or feet, but in miles. While I will not be here next year as part of this board, I'm excited nonetheless by the future. SuperSAC recently had our elections for student representative, and I'm pleased to announce that Mina Jayswal of Lincoln High School and Sierra Jose of Franklin High School will be the 2014-2015 student representative and student representative alternate, respectively. As someone going into her third year in SuperSAC, Mina brings a wealth of experience to the table, and I'm not only confident in her abilities, but I'm excited to see her champion the legacy of student voice within PPS. Please join me in giving a round of applause for Mina and Yay. Sierra. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. And on behalf of the students of Portland, thank you for serving on this board. Thank you, Andrew. Um, this time we'll go ahead and take uh, public comment. Ms. Hewson, is, are the, excuse me, do we have anyone signed up for public comment? Yes, we do. We have six. Our first two speakers are Danine Berglund and Nicole Markwell. So while those two individuals are coming forward, I'll go ahead and read the instructions for public comment, if they're coming forward. I'm not seeing. Ms. Houston, do you want to go ahead and call the next two? Sure. Eduardo Bella Unzarin and Yolanda Cabrera. Nope. 
Our next two speakers would be Micah Yee and Mary Rohr. There you go. Okay, I'll go ahead and read the public uh, instructions. How's that? Yeah. yeah. We're just we see that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for taking the time to come to our, our board meeting. We deeply value public input and we look forward to hearing your thoughts, reflections, and concerns. Our responsibility as a board lies in actively listening and reflecting on the thoughts and opinions of others. Guidelines for public input emphasize respect and consideration when referring to board members, staff, and other presenters. The board will not respond to any comments or questions at this time, but the board or staff will follow up on various issues that are raised. Please make sure you've left your contact information with Ms. Hewson. Pursuant to board policy 1.7.012, speakers may offer objective criticism of district operations and programs, but the board will not hear complaints concerning individual district personnel. Any complaints about specific employees should be directed to the superintendent's office and will not be heard at this forum. You have a total of three minutes to share your comments. First two, please start, start by stating your name and spelling your last name for the record. For the first two minutes of testimony, you'll see the green light. The last minute, you'll see uh, the yellow light, and then the red light comes on, and a buzzer will sound, and we ask that you wrap up your comments at that time. We respectfully, um, we sincerely appreciate your input, and we thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. My name is Micah Yai, Y-E-I-G-H, and I am an assistant adjunct professor at Portland State University and a parent of two children at Da Vinci Arts Middle School. I was here last Monday as well. Um, but since I was here last week, I was part of a parent group that conducted a survey of just over 400 Da Vinci Arts Middle School parents. We received um, slightly over 200 responses to our survey. And overwhelmingly, as you can see from in front of you, parents support the current core structure that is designed to support the emotional and academic needs of our children. Um, it is developmentally appropriate for children between the ages of 11 and 15 to have a supportive structure in place that is a bridge between elementary school and high school. Um, today, at Da Vinci Arts Middle School, over 250 kids staged a walkout. They were out of the building for about two hours. Um, and they, um, the press covered the protest, the Oregonian was there. In addition to the material you have in front of you, there were over 300 comments to that survey. Um, in meetings with administration, the conversation has been about some students not meeting math benchmarks. This year, the school tried an intervention using 84 minutes of flex period about 20 times throughout the school year to support students who are struggling with math. Um, I met with administration um, earlier, the, uh, sorry, late last week, and when I asked if the intervention had worked, they said they had not collected any data to see if the intervention had worked. Um, however, um, in an Oregonian article, a Da Vinci Arts Middle School teach, math teacher um, wrote a response to an article. She opposes the changes and said that actually she had tracked data and kids had made improvements that they, we were wondering, did they start here and get to here and the benchmarks here? Or did they start here and got here and the benchmarks here? Well, it turned out they had made growth. And this was a thing that was um, not very, the teachers will say, it wasn't as planned out as if they had really put efforts in to make it very targeted and strategic as they could in the future. Um, so, students had improved. So, I would say that kids who struggle academically are those same students who benefit the most from having the current course structure. When I asked the administration last week how struggling kids are doing in their core classroom, they have no data. They have not collected any data to see how struggling kids are doing in their core classes and whether that is a support for those children. So I'm fully in support of finding a solution that raises math scores. In the current structure, there's that 84 minute block once a week that could be used to target those children that um, would, it, would address the needs without dramatically altering the core experience for all the kids. That structure benefits every child at that school. Parents are very dissatisfied with the proposed changes, and we urge a more reasonable response. And actually, the parents are tomorrow night will be demanding it at the school. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm Mary Rower, R O W E R. I am the mother of a sixth grade student at Da Vinci Middle School, and I fought very hard to get her into Da Vinci. She's a unique student. Da Vinci's a unique place and uniquely meets her needs as a, a student and a young woman. Anna will be one of the students that loses her important core teacher if this is implemented. Um, I have, uh, um, 
I've, I've heard that a change in the scheduling um, is um, necessary for the students, but I see it as uh, a gutting of the core program. It's just necessary to, uh, to homogenize um, Portland uh, schools, um, all middle schools, so that they're all the same. But it really shortchanges parents, teachers, and especially the students. Um, as a parent with two students in the Portland Public School District, I've endured leadership changes, uh, teacher downsizing, district changes, increased class sizes, and a lack of stability uh, within the schools. Um, it's difficult to maintain support and faith in a system that it has been reliably unreliable. Um, the proposed changes also hurt da Vinci teachers. Teachers will not only teach more students, it's significantly more students. It's going to increase the number of students teachers are responsible for from anywhere from 60, uh, or 90 to 160 students versus the current 60 to 65 students they currently teach. Um, that's, that's perhaps upwards of 100 more students they need to teach, test, grade, and supervise. There's no re way they can give individual, individualized attention to the students um, at, at those numbers. Um, and I also question the board's motivation uh, for the staff changes um, and wonder if it isn't a response to recent teacher negotiations and voice concerned over these class sizes. On its face, the decision to see, it seems to be punitive in nature. Uh, I know that teachers have voiced concerns about how, how many students they're teaching and now they're going to have more, more <coughs> students on their, on their roles to teach. And most importantly, this decision seems to be bad for the students. It's not a good model for the developmental age of these middle schoolers. Um, I've heard the reason is to better prepare the students for high school, but the middle school years are when students get lost. And this is when students most need mentorship, guidance, and continuity of a core teacher, a stable adult who knows each student as more than a student ID and a standardized test score. Um, if we're truly preparing these kids for high school, why don't we take our high school curriculums and make them lecture halls like they will experience in college to better prepare them for college. There's a reason we don't do that. It's not a good uh, model for, for children at that age. Uh, also, the gutting of the core program foregoes some important learning opportunities, including uh, community involvement and um, the uh, uh, field trips. Um, it, it reduces also language arts, um, and arts language arts is also an arts-based curriculum. Da Vinci's an arts-based school, so to say that it's not gonna reduce arts is um, also folly. Um, I believe that Da Vinci's a creative school, and we can find creative solutions, but this isn't it. Great. Thank you very much for testimony. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to our bond accountability quarterly update. I thought I saw yep. Mr. Spellman up there. The board is pleased to welcome Kevin Spellman, the chair of the bond uh, accountability committee to our meeting tonight. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, on the committee's review of the work of the, on, the, uh, on the bond. The committee is comprised of, I think it's seven individuals, isn't it, Kevin? Seven individuals with expertise in large construction projects, and the board is thankful for the service of these individuals. And, and thank you very much for both of you being here tonight. I'm Co-Chair Co Belial, Board, Superintendent Smith. With me is, uh, is one of those experts, Tom That's Peterson, right. who's Chief Engineer of the Port of Portland. And um, he's especially important on our committee because there really aren't many people in a, in a city like Portland with experience of a capital program like this, and Tom's one of the few who does. Um, he's seen more than one uh, cycle of these programs. Um, what we um, bring for you tonight are really some mixed messages. We're gonna give you some, I think, good news and some concerns. And then we're go going to um, suggest that we have a little bit of a conflict between schedule needs and budget needs. Um, so bear with us. Um, <clears throat> we met April 23rd at Marshall High School um, and got an update on the program. Um, good, some good things have been happening. As you know, the Fabian um, master plan was approved um, and they're continuing to work now on uh, schematic design. 
IP 2014 work has been broken down into six packages. Um, with a cautionary note there, they have even less time this summer than last summer to, put, to do this work. Um, and they will be working six, six days, which I'm guessing has an impact on their bids, um, which at least the ones that have come in so far are over budget, manageably so, we think, but we'll see. Um, we have a couple of uh, kind of social um, related uh, criteria that are underway. The workforce training and hiring program is in place for this summer that deals with apprenticeship and with continuing to watch the MWESB participation. We don't yet have a report on the summer, the summer bids, um, uh, but it, and nothing much has happened in the last quarter, so <coughs> the percentage hasn't changed. Okay, some good news. Um, <laughs> we've uh, talked to you and you've expressed concern over the past few reports about student involvement and what the seeming lack thereof. Um, the report we received showed that uh, over 6,000 students have now been exposed to bond program related um, um, presentations or job fairs or um, um, having uh, input sought from them. Um, and this is, this is a dramatic change from where, where we were. And the staff has agreed with us and I think with you that the metric we were using before was not sufficient and now we've got some more focused metrics that I think will be really helpful going forward. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to call out um, uh, three of the consultants, um, Heary, International Program Manager, Dower, the architect at Franklin, and Bassetti, architect at Roosevelt. All three of those uh, will be engaging interns independent of PPS funding. So they've really kind of stepped up to the plate here. Okay, budget. Last time we talked about the fact that things seem to be generally on track as far as we could tell. Um, except for the bond oversight cost. If you recall, that was a little, the projection was over budget. Um, staff has worked on that and they've reduced the projected overage item. But of course, another one popped up and that's the OSIP, Owner Controlled Insurance Program. Um, but they are also in the process of rebudgeting some items to substantially take care of that from uh, contingency and from the savings of from last year, last summer. Um, Kevin, I'm, I'm, I'm yes, sorry sir. To Can you talk? I think you mentioned in your report that over the over the course of the bond program, we're ex we're hoping that the plan with that would that that would be budget neutral. Correct. Is that correct. That, that's the, that's the suggestion for OSIP. Uh, some. Some of us have some skepticism about that just because I think you probably never really know, but there's certainly value in it. And so Tom has uh, yeah, some we, experience we, with we've those had programs. We've the programs to port, and what you're banking on, you're kind of taking on the risk, and what you're banking on are low claims. So in order for an OSEP to be um, successful, you need to have a really robust safety program to make sure you minimize your exposure to claims, and if, if you're successful, then yes, it is, um, there is uh, ultimate savings to the organization. But you're rolling the dice a little bit, um, but we've had good success with our OSIP programs. Uh, we, in both cases, we were able to um, show a, a benefit, and one of our OSIP programs actually uh, covered the collapse of the garage that we had back in 97, where we had three workers killed, and um, which is a very unfortunate incident, but actually the OSHA program was very beneficial for us in that case as well. So, um, so they can be a good, good tool, but they do come with some extra administrative costs on the part of the contractors and staff to some degree and, um, and, and a really diligent effort on making sure you have a great, a strong safety program. <clears throat> 
so is that we have a good strong safety program that or the is program it the contractors does. that we work with yeah. have good strong but, safety but programs? Need, you, need, you need to help Both. and make sure that Both. <laughs> generally, generally your uh, OSIP administrator will be actively engaged in right. their safety programs right. as well. Right. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, <clears throat> at, the, uh, at the meeting, we went through the budget situation at that time, and that's really been kind of overtaken by events, and so we'll come back to that in a second. Um, our focus at the meeting was primarily schedule and, and remains schedule, uh, although that's now in conflict with the budget challenges we have. Uh, Franklin High School um, schematic design is 90 days behind the original baseline schedule. Roosevelt is 110 days behind. Those, that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. Uh, we just want to caution everybody not to get too excited about that in the fact that that's against a very, very broad baseline schedule, and the designers and the contractors are now working to show how they can make that up. Uh, nevertheless, it's an increased risk item. Um, part of it has been due to this board and the changes you've made. Part of it has been due to the um, uh, extraordinary amount of um, public outreach that's occurred, and, and we have a little concern about how that has played out not being critical of the concept of public outreach at all or any of the public who were outreached. Um, they really have done their job, what you'd expect them to do. They've advocated for the best possible facility that they're working on. What they don't have is budget and schedule responsibility for the entire program. So there's a conflict there that uh, has come up. Um, we were introduced at the last meeting to the, the, quote, additional criteria for high schools, and frankly, we're still a little fuzzy about what that means. Well, we know what it means. Quite how you get from that criteria to what it means, we don't, we don't understand yet. And um, we, we actually have a briefing this coming Friday on Franklin High School, and, and I think the intent is that we'll we'll start to understand that a little better. But as of right now, we, we don't understand that. We also were not presented at that meeting with any kind of cost Im implications or funding sources. Those have since come out. So again, events kind of took over there. And um, that's really where the, the remainder of our remarks uh, need to be focused, I think. Um, the, the BAC, from what we know today, is not supportive of the current budgeting, because we don't understand it, or the sources of the funding. We don't understand some of the uh, budgeting. For instance, there is a line item in the staff memo that supports the resolution uh, that you're, you're voting on tonight that says uh, value engineering, $18 million. We don't know what that means. Value engineering typically is used in the schematic design phase or even later to bring scope back to budget. And I'm sure it did some of that. We, we don't know, but I'm sure it did some of that. But one way to read that is that the $18 million is a failure of value engineering. So we don't know what that, what that item is. And I think for the public, they need to know what that is. Um, the additional criteria is also um, calculated at $18 million. And clearly, that's additional classrooms, so we know that. But we don't really understand how we get from the, quote, criteria to the additional classrooms at this point. Maybe we'll learn that. Um, so there's an additional $36 million that's got to come from somewhere. And at this point, the um, memo says it comes from two places. One is future IP work um, with, I, I think, in parenthesis, the hope that there'll be additional savings someplace else to, to backfill that. Um, and from the escalation reserve. 
And that one is really double puzzling, I think, for us. Because I think even in our first report, we expressed concern that the escalation reserve seemed maybe a little skinny to us. And if you take money from the escalation, <clears throat> that, that's supposed to address inflation. Well, inflation doesn't go away. So if we take the money out of escalation and inflation remains, let's say the original reserve was exactly right, um, which we're skeptical of, um, we've got a scope hole. So we've got to deal with this scope versus budget issue in our judgment uh, at this point. Um, the other thing that <clears throat> I think is important to remind everyone, that the resolution you're going to vote on today is to realign the long-range facilities plan and the ed specs with where we are today. And that, from, from a practical, from practice, best practices, that's kind of the, ba that's backwards, right? We set guiding principles in the uh, long-range facilities plan, then the ed specs were intended to set standards, and now we're going back to change them so they fit with what we now want to do. Maybe exactly the right thing to do, I don't know. But from a practical standpoint, it's, it's backwards. The, the other thing that's, I think, important to remember is the long-range facilities plan was, was pretty um, um, straightforward, upfront, that non-capital solutions should be considered prior to capital solutions. And at least at this point, we haven't seen any evidence that that has happened. Maybe it has behind the scenes and judgments have been made. But um, if, if, our, um, if our, the scope of our projects are not sufficient to meet capacity or, or whatever, then we should be looking at non-capital solutions, at least as well as capital, maybe in place of capital. Want to add anything? To yeah, I guess the other thing that I add, and I, I had some concerns um, when I s started seeing the designs and how much new construction, um, how much of a component of both of the high schools was going to be new construction, and never really quite understood how that was, in, how much of that was anticipated in the budgeting process. Uh, so I suspect that part of the growth although I haven't been briefed to the level to really understand it, is that part of the reason that the budget has increased is there's a, probably a higher percentage of new construction than maybe was originally anticipated in, in the, uh, the bond measure. Coupled with that, what also is con of concern to me is we have the, ben fortunately we have the benefit of designs and process for Roosevelt and Franklin and contractors on board to help uh, validate costs, um, and but which you know, which equates to budgets, uh, do some being, but we don't have that benefit yet for grant, and so my concern is, and I have no idea, don't really understand. So what is the number, and how much of that increase applies to the grant project where we haven't started any of that design process? So I have some real concerns that, you know given the, how the first two have gone, that you're gonna be faced with a similar problem uh, in a year or two when grant gets into full swing and all of a sudden you see another increase because of the way the design ends up, the amount of new construction and so forth. Unfortunately, I don't have the benefit of having seen the numbers, what they're based on or understand. So, so I'm kind of a, a little bit in the dark here, but <clears throat> those are my concerns, my reaction to when I saw the report. I want to come back just to one thing to, to emphasize, maybe I skipped over it a little, the, the, the quote, borrowing from future IP work. Um, we're, we're, you know, part of our charge is to, is to um, hold the program accountable to the promises made. And, and we feel pretty strongly that an, there's an obligation to, to um, uh, allocate the correct amount of money to the seismic and roofing and science classrooms work 
there was a hedge there in the in the bond program that it was up to 63 million uh, 63 schools but but at least my sense and i think that of taxpayers was we'll do that within that quote budgeted amount not that we take some of that budget and spend it someplace else so happy to answer questions if okay. board members questions Director Curler? Is, is staff going to respond to some of the concerns? I mean, I've, as essentially what I'm hearing is you're, you're, you're saying that we shouldn't be voting on the resolution that we're voting on tonight. Uh, I, I, I don't know if we're saying that. We're just saying that as a bond accountability committee, we haven't really had an opportunity to really understand and weigh in on the recommendations to be able to support this. I'd, I'd add, Director Kohler, I'd, I'd add to that that the resolution really doesn't deal with the funding specifically. It may imply that <coughs> that's, that's, you know, the funding will support this resolution. The resolution pretty much says that staff will go back and, quote, fix the Long Range Facilities Plan and the Ed Specs so that they're consistent with the current plan. Um, I guess the question for you to answer is if if you vote for that to happen can you then roll that back again if you need to and I don't know the answer to that that's that's uh, for you to decide mm -hmm. um, do, you well, have, do you have some specific questions for yeah. staff or do you want no I'm just okay I'm just the, uh, you mentioned the, the process being backwards um, and I guess I, I've just challenged that for a second. I want to get your feedback on it. Yeah. Um, it's you, we're we're looking at um, in more than three schools. We're looking at <coughs> over the course of a lifetime. Right. Uh, doing a lot more than that. Um, these are the first two right. that we've done, and right. in that process, um, there seems to have been some learning, uh, which is in, which is natural. Um, so isn't it appropriate to take that learning and put it back into um, into the master plans and the design specs and well, the larger uh, documents? Uh, maybe it is, um, but I don't. I'm not sure we we know the answer to that. And, and I, what what I guess I'm suggesting is that there is no perfect solution to or the perfect facility. If we were to to continue outreach for another two months, we'd get more good ideas, legitimately good ideas. But at some point, you have to say, no more. And maybe we have to say, for instance, that we really want the, these programs we've identified and learned about in this period of time, but we can't afford them with the planned capacity, for instance. So we have to, if we want that program, maybe the capacity's got to come back or to get it within budget. Um, I, I, there, I think we forget how much outreach there was in both the, developing the long, uh, long range facilities plan and the uh, ed specs, huge amount. And you know, the sense is that the, the, the last loudest, um, um, advocate um, is gets gets their way and again I'm not being critical about any of those advocates because if I were in their shoes I'd do the same thing but it doesn't fit within as far as we can tell it doesn't fit within the budget so we have to come we think we have to come up with other solutions okay. Director Beal? When you say it doesn't fit what is the it when you say it doesn't fit within the budget the it is the, <coughs> the uh, changes that we've made is that what you're referring correct to? Including all of the changes are part of the well it's a, it's a cumulative I was asking thing. you guys the wrong question so I'm trying to ask you maybe a right question here. okay well the the staff memo that supports the resolution shows the iteration of how we got from the original budget for the high schools Right, it added the 10 million for the increased capacity, added I think 1 million for, for fields, 
and then added 18 million for VE, which we don't, again, don't understand, and 18 million for the quote additional criteria. Now, when you add all that up, it doesn't fit within the budget, which is why the memo at least argues to take that money from someplace else within the program. The program's limited. It is what it is. And, and I guess I would be uh, cautious about um, looking for another bond measure, for instance, that's supposed to put a roof on some of those schools that we said we're going to be roofed under this bond measure. So there's $36 million you just said you didn't understand what it was? Right. So you're the bond oversight people, basically, and you don't understand what $36 million of the bond stuff is? I mean, I'm not saying that's that in a negative. I'm just saying that's the, that's, okay. No, thank you. Uh, the second question I have is, if, if we went exactly with what we have now and just went forward, would we have to, in your opinion, do you actually know, and how strong is your opinion on, would we have to cut any of the seismic retrofitting? But that's the proposal, Director sure. Boyle. That's Cutting some, yes. I, I can't be, I don't know the specifics, but. It, but the proposal proposes true. to cut some of that retrofitting? Yes. Correct. $18 million uh, worth. Uh, but what, how much of that is seismic, we don't really know. $22 I mean, it's, million. It's a combination of roofing and other right. repairs, but a seismic is a component of that. <clears throat> Thank you. Director Regan? Would we have an opportunity to maybe get some individual briefings from our operations folks before we vote on this? The, we'll have discussion before we vote tonight, yes. They're here that's a later part of the agenda is actually talking about. So I think you're generating some of the questions that are being raised here and seeing whether or not you're actually in the dialogue later on. I mean, this is a clear tension point that we knew we would be in. It's exactly the conversation that you need to be having mm -hmm. because as um, Director Curler pointed out, we have been learning things in this on these first two buildings that we were saying, okay, how do we use these so that the first two schools benefit from them? It may be that we decide these are the learnings and they apply going forward, but not to the first two schools. I mean, there's j these are exactly the tension points that you should be discussing. So, um, and we'll have the opportunity to, during um, the discussion later today, and it may be that you decide and you wait for until um, the Bond of Accountability Committee has been briefed and gets to have further discussion before you take action, but you're also hearing the tension point around the continued conversation. And some of these have been your interests that we've continued to consider and look at, are there ways to be able to fund the things people are now in deeper conversation about as we're further into the bond? So, I mean, at the front end, when we're talking with the Long Range Facilities Committee and then we're talking with the Ed Specs Group, we're in a broad level of conversation. We're now into really specifics and with a, diff a different crowd that are talking about their own building. And so naturally a different level of, of specifics are being raised that we're thinking inform what's the baseline um, that we think we want to inform the entire high school system. So like it's a right conversation to be in at this point. Um, and I just think it's sequencing so people feel like you have enough information at the point you're actually making a call because all of it is trade off and risk and e and about the final product of what we're going to end up with. And we have, um, I think as staff said, these first high schools and the rebuilds of these first high schools are a really significant thing to do right. Um, and so make sure that we've really, you know, given the consider and the, the community engagement where people have been deeply in thinking about, again, in two different schools and we've had the dynamic of two different design committees meeting simultaneously and informing each other. So it's been, it's been a complex um, design conversation and the right conversation for you all to be having tonight. I just add it was for, for, for our um, discussion with staff later. Thank you very much for your report and your, your careful oversight. Um, <clears throat> so then one question obviously is just with the, the, the issue of the timeline and the schedule. So no matter what we do, whether we approve the resolution or ask staff to scale back to where we were before, that's the question of what, how does that impact our, our schedule and our ability to regain that time and, and get this moving forward. So. Um, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I'm hoping that, that we can have that discussion with staff. I'm also concerned to hear that our, for whatever you know, timing issues or whatever it might be, that our committee really needs to have that full 
that full information. Uh, on the other hand, I want us to keep moving forward. So again, right. the, the, right. the tensions here. Mm -hmm. um, and um, like everyone else, you know, considerable heartburn about the possibility that unless things align and things work go well for us, that we would eventually have to take in future years some of the seismic and roofing um, projects out um, that we had hoped to accomplish. So that obviously is a huge concern as well. Um, so thank you, and I guess we'll hear more from staff later on tonight. Other comments from board members? No? No? Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here tonight. I know that I'm not sure if you're going to stick around and see what happens with uh, when staff is talking with us, but I'm sure that they'll be covering schedule, budget, scope, all of those issues with us again, um, and would appreciate having you here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, at this time, we're going to off of my original agenda, <clears throat> move off of my original agenda, and um, ask um, Brenda Reagan, who is the um, Belinda. 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 Excuse me. <laughs> excuse me, Belinda, uh, president of PFSP, uh, to come to the staff table uh, for some brief comments. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I apologize. I have coming to have, have, are coming down off of a, a cold from the weekend, so uh, pardon me if I'm I stopped to cough during the midst of this. <laughs> I tried to sit in the farthest regions of this room so that I wouldn't disturb everybody while I coughed. And, and thank you, Neil, for the cough drop too. <laughs> Good evening, Carol and school board members. Oh, I should announce that I'm Belinda Regan, president of PFSP. I wish I could say that I'm here this evening to share a feeling of goodwill with all of you, but sadly I'm not. With such positive news coming from the district in the past few weeks that 350 to 400 certified employees are being recruited, and for the first time in many years, across the board cuts are not necessary. Those of us in PFSP were so very hopeful, sharing our excitement with our membership that it appeared we would not see layoffs again this year. That joyful forecast of a layoff-free summer has been shattered, as once again for the eighth year in a row, the fine employees represented by PFSP are the prime target of Portland Public Schools' unassignments and expected layoffs. Having recently learned that 70 PFSP classified employees have been notified that their positions will no longer exist in the fall, I truly feel such a sense of betrayal by this district and you as members of the board. Of those 70 individuals who were unassigned, thankfully, many will find placements in the positions being vacated by retiring and resigning staff. While attrition may seem a resolution to the bigger issue of unassignments, please keep in mind that this remains a reduction in classified numbers by 70 people, far too high in this year of seeming financial comfort when compared to the past seven. While 70 of our workers are scrambling to maintain employment in order to keep dinner on their tables, shelter for their families and their bills paid, we have seen at least a half dozen postings for high level positions that have been added to the administrative roster, jobs new to PPS. <clears throat> I can't help but wonder how many of the 70 employees cut from our schools could have been retained had these highly compensated jobs not been created and budgeted for. At last count, 27 members of our bargaining group without jobs next year are educational assistants, dedicated workers without whom the classrooms of our very youngest will not function successfully. We see very little hope for the return of many of these souls, resulting in a significant number of layoffs once again. And yet, year after year, during each budget crisis that has reduced the number of PFSP classified employees by now more than 400 in total. I have sat before you asking, why us? Why are such good, hard-working people always under attack year after year in such enormous numbers? Why? Why is it that the classified employees of PPS are not allowed to enjoy the largesse that is providing for the hiring of hundreds of new personnel in other groups this year? Why are we being cut? again. 
I know my words most likely make no difference to you as I sit before you pleading for an end to this annual slaughter. I'm trying to make sense of something so, I'm tired of trying to make sense of something so senseless. Those I represent are tired of the uncertainty of layoffs and joblessness. Will the classified employee be given an opportunity to ever, ever truly feel appreciated by this district? Not by proclamations or plaques or by perfunctory words spoken at a celebratory school board meeting to which our employees are no longer invited, but by stable living wage jobs at work sites that can become their second homes along children and families and staff with whom they can form, st can form strong working partnerships Will this ever happen again? All of this leads me to wonder when these 350 to 400 new teachers are placed in classrooms next fall, who will be there to provide the assistance so desperately needed to help our students reach the pinnacle of their success? Obviously, it won't be the new EAs who were hired earlier this year when FTE was added back into buildings, as they are low in seniority and they're now facing layoff. How profoundly tragic for the youngsters enrolled in this district. I would like to suggest that each of you take a few moments this evening to think about the consequences of the systemic eradication of the district's classified workers. For without us, your schools, your offices, and your classrooms will not function. I can only hope that you, as school board members, will suffer the effect of allowing these annual cuts to continue in complaints from building administrators, teachers, parents, and from the community. Whether or not you will take heed is certainly another matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Reagan. Question? We're not doing questions with this woman? Really? Really. We're not doing questions? Thank well, you. Thank you very much for coming. I had questions coming. of you. I'm sorry that I am not well, able to Director ask Director Buell, them. you're out of order. I'd be glad to call you and See where we're at. Crazy. Can't ask a question. Okay, at this time, we're going to go back to um, our earlier uh, issue on the agenda of having public comment. We were so far ahead of schedule that several of the families, <coughs> uh, members, or people who wanted to testify were not here. So I'm going to go ahead and ask them. Uh, Ms. Houston, will you go ahead and call for public comment at this time? Uh, first two speakers, Deneen Berglund and Nicole Markwell. And I hope they're here. I, I thought I saw them come in. There we go. <clears throat> I'm not going to read the entire instructions for public comment again, but just to let you know that uh, before you begin speaking, please state your last name and spell it for the record. Um, the lights in front of you, the green light will come on indicating you have two minutes the yellow light another minute and when the red light comes on we ask that you wrap up your comments okay. thank you very much thank you so you go my, ahead. Na my last name is Berglund it's spelled b-e-r-g-l-a-n-d my first name is Deneen I'm here from Scott School and I just want to read a little um, something that I have here Harvey Scott School is a K through eight converted in, from a K five in 2006 to save money during a financial crisis for the district. We are one of the most diverse schools in the district. 82% of our students are kids of color. More specifically, 56% of our students are Latino and 38% of our students are English language learners. We are also a high poverty school. 87% of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch. Our diversity is one of the things we value about our school and parents, teachers, and kids see it as a great asset to our kids' education. Two years ago, Scott School started a dual language Spanish immersion program, the best thing to happen to our school in years. With over 56% Latino population of students and 38% ELL, an immersion program for our school was a no-brainer. It was an answer to the achievement gap crisis for ELL and kids of color, and it made our school attractive to families both in and out of our neighborhood who wanted language immersion. People were actually choosing to lottery into our school rather than out of it, bringing their much needed energy and support to our school. Our first two years, we had four kindergarten sections, three of them immersion. We've seen incredible academic growth in the first two years for the students in that program. 
We've added talented, specially trained teachers who reflect the culture of the majority of our students and who contribute to the overall diversity of our staff, making our school more welcoming to all our families of color. Unfortunately, because of the size of our building and the fact that we are K through eight, we were on a path to overcrowding and the district closed our lottery for next year. As a result, we lost an immersion kindergarten section next year and immersion kindergarten class sizes will swell to around 30 or more. Students registering late won't have access to immersion, including Spanish speaking kids. Parents of immersion kids are worried that the program at only two years in is already dwindling and will wither on the vine. Teachers will have to be shuffled around from year to year to handle these differently sized cohorts. And as we know, numbers equal staff, so we'll earn fewer FTE and resources. We are at capacity, but under enrolled. We can't grow and it's hard to maintain robust programs given the space we have and the range of grades we serve. In the meantime, our middle school struggles to hold on to the enrollment numbers it needs. We have very talented and dedicated teachers in the middle school program and every year as our enrollment at that level dwindles, we risk losing uh, their positions. It's difficult to cover all the bases in a small program that earns so few FTE and must spread resources across nine grades. This year, our middle schoolers had no scheduled library time. They had no computer lab and no science lab. Their elective choices include working in the cafeteria or the school office. They have no music classes. They have no school-sponsored sports. Scott students deserve better. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Nicole Markwell, M-A-R-K-W-E-L-L. -L. Prompted by concern for our children, a group of parents, predominantly Latino and white, started meeting and sharing stories in an attempt to be proactive. Through our discussions, we decided to create a survey to find out what factors are the most important to the Scott community. We held three meetings focused on getting parent involvement and, and two events during the day, during the school day, one for teacher input and one for student input. As Deneen stated, Scott is very proud of the diversity in our community, so it was very important to us that we engage the entire Scott community rather than rely on a small portion of active people who tend to be mostly white. We worked with liaisons assigned to Scott, Ula Fassan, who made personal phone calls to invite and engage our Somali community, as well as provide translation at, meeting, at meetings where there was no paid Somali interpreter, and Tony Pham, who helped with Vietnamese translation and inviting members of our Vietnamese community to participate in meetings. Additionally, some of our Latina mothers personally invited members from the Latino community and went door to door handing out flyers for the meetings. Because of our outreach and cross-cultural bridge building, the meetings were very diverse. Our second meeting was made up of all Latino and Somali families. Over 30 families participated in that event. For the parent meetings, we had a presentation informing families about what Scott has in terms of electives and compared that with other schools, both middle schools like Beaumont and other K-8 schools. Dr. Gutierrez also talked about why we are having this discussion. Boundary review and Scott classrooms filling up and running out of space, then what she sees is the options moving forward. Following the presentation, parents were asked to take part in the survey. There were 18 large sheets of paper, each with a statement in both English and Spanish. Parents were given 20 stickers and asked to distribute their stickers among the statements. Statements they agreed with more were given more stickers. Those statements that parents didn't agree with got no stickers. Parents were asked to use all of their stickers. In our efforts to reach out to all of our communities, we held meetings not just at the school, but also the Hacienda apartments where many of our families live. We held meetings in English with Spanish, Somali, and Vietnamese translation. We also had our second meeting conducted in Spanish with English translation. Over 110 parents participated in these surveys, as well as about 30 staff and over 100 middle school students. By a wide margin, the top two most important factors for parents and teachers are, I want Scott to have a robust Spanish immersion program, and I want my child to attend a safe school. Those who support Scott remaining a K-8, particularly our families of color, cited transportation convenience and the ability for older children to help with younger children. Those who support transitioning to a K-5 program focused on access to advanced courses, art, music, and other electives in that order. The middle school students indicated that their top priority was for field trips with after school sports team coming in second. After that, the votes were for more electives, especially art. I have included all the results um, for all the questions in my handout, which will be available online along with the raw data. Scott students deserve better. 
Great. I made coffees for everybody. Too. That, great. That's great. great. You can go ahead and give them to us, or you can give them to Ms. Houston, and she'll give them to us. So, thank you very much to both of you for your comments and for your hard work in making sure that your in community is so inclusive and you're hearing from everybody in your community. Our next two speakers, Eduardo Bella Unzarin and Yolanda Cabrera. Yolanda couldn't make it tonight. Do we have another chair? Uh, but we're going to have um, we go. them reading some of the things that are Thank important you, about our school. Okay. Hang on just a second. Let's get everybody settled here. Okay, great. Go ahead. Um, my name is Eduardo Belanzaran. Is B E L A U N Z A R A N. And um, these couple of students are here representing Yolanda. My name's Amy. My name's Amy Alvarado, A L V A R A D O. And I'm a freshman at Madison and I went to Harvey Scott um, kindergarten through eighth grade. Um I'm Isaac Alvarado, and I've gone to Scott for <laughs> since kindergarten through seventh grade. Yeah. We're gonna um, say some comments that some parents and students left from one of the meetings that they had. I want the school to be a safer place, and that. Fifth graders gain access to a bathroom and an area to drink water, and, there sh and that there would be cameras around the school. I want to know where my son will be for school in the future so we can plan. I hope it is here. I think that having a good immersion program is more important than our not so good middle school. My child struggled in Chinese immersion K through first. We return to our neighborhood school for the English only teaching she needs. I want an effective, dynamic, functional, and diverse library where my child can have access to knowledge. It's ridiculous that I don't allow her to take books home. I am very happy with the immersion program. That's why we're here. More advanced courses, for example, science, math, and language. I want more partnering with parents in early grades for literacy and math. I love my Spanish immersion teacher. That room is very calm. I worry about my child's safety out of this classroom. We were promised the district was committed to the immersion program when our child signed up. Committing means committing. I drive 15 minutes twice a day so that my daughter is in the Spanish immersion program. It's very important and that's why we are here. I love the diversity at Scott and hope to have my kids stay, but if the academics don't improve in middle school, I will pull them out. Keep immersion. Sixth through eighth should stay, and there needs to be more safety. I want safety surveillance at the school. This seems like a no-brain solution. Middle school students should have better access to extracurricular programs, and Spanish immersion programs should have room to grow. I am so impressed by the dedication of Scott's teachers, but especially Maestra Flores. I want all teachers at Scott to be ELL endorsed. I want culturally competent instructors. I want K through eight and immersion to stay together. We need to sustain the Spanish immersion at Scott. What we need is the most is for sixth, seventh, and eighth to stay. We need middle school for people that live in this neighborhood. I want the school to have immersion buses and middle school security that protects the school. Good evening, my name is Eduardo Belanzaran. I am a parent at Scott School. My first language is Spanish. My wife is American. I will be talking to you in English tonight. It is our first year at Scott. My daughter goes to kindergarten. It is a very special school, and we are very happy with this community. It's diversity. There are Somali, Asian, Hispanic, and American families. I'm sure there are more. 
The size of the school is also very satisfying. The teachers and the Spanish immersion program, which is the reason we had to be at Scott School. Our daughter has learned so much Spanish during the past year, it is very exciting. And I hear comments like these from many other parents at our school. Nevertheless, it is hard not to notice the lack of resources the students have to cope with. They don't have a computer lab. They need better technology and science labs. They lack a solid sports and arts program. Their electives are limited to office or cafeteria assistance instead of drama, music, math, or any other choices they could have to better their education and that other schools enjoy. Also, because of the size of our school, we don't have full-time counselors and many other necessary personnel, such as librarian and our teacher. As a result, teachers have to overextend themselves many times. Our kids are well behaved and have good family values. They deserve a fair chance and education. I don't believe the size of a school or the number of students that attend it should dictate the amount of support or quality of education that they may get or deserve. Many of these students have unquestionable talents and potentials yet to be discovered. And they deserve to at least have options during their upbringing. Children need a proper and equal education so that they don't fall behind further as they will go on high school. They also need the confidence and tools that many others enjoy in the Portland Public Schools. We invite you to visit our school I enjoy its warm diversity and to please support the needs of our students so that they enjoy a healthier growth. Your decisions affect society on the utmost human level and Scott students are in need of a fair and conscious education and growth. It is a win-to-win -win situation for families and society. Thanks for your time and attention. Have a good evening. And thank you very much for your testimony. We'll find out. Ms. Houston, is that the end of citizen yes. comment? Thank you very much. OK, at this time, um, we will move to our next agenda item, which is the evaluation for Superintendent Smith. Um, I'm going to. Um, I think I'm going to start with this. Um, we completed the evaluation for Superintendent Smith uh, last week uh, after some delay um, because we were trying to make sure that we had all the information that we needed, including where we were on our milestones and a number of other um, indicators that were included within her um, goals for the year. And so, uh, so we were able to delay that and just finish it up last week. Um, for myself, um, I uh, was very, I'm very pleased with um, Superintendent Smith's performance in this district. Um, over the seven years that she's been here, we have continued to um, raise the graduation rate, and in the last four years, I think we're up 14 points. Um, we've uh, closed our achievement gap, not closing our achievement gap, and in some places closed it. Um, we, uh, with, under Superintendent Smith's leadership, uh, passed a bond. We have a local option levy that helped us through those times that, uh, as we were having to make cuts, helped us make fewer cuts. Um, we have done a number of things in this district to um, help our students achieve, including the uh, initiation and continuation of um, dual immersion programs, more work on ELL, work at the high school level. Um, the, the list is endless of the work that the Superintendent Smith has done that has allowed us to move forward in this district and um, have those uh, gains that we've had both in our um, graduation rate and in our um, 
narrowing of that achievement gap. So I'm very pleased uh, with her evaluation and what we've uh, uh, and and the job that she has done for us. And I look forward to having her here with us for many more years. So I'm happy to take the comments from all of my other board members. I know that everybody else has comments to make as well. So who wants to? Director Kerr. Yeah, so um, our evaluation, I think, uh, that the, is submitted is, um, speaks uh, for, its, for itself. And what, what I wanted to do um, was uh, just lay out a few areas where I think we should focus, focus on, that I personally want to focus on for the next remaining um, time, <coughs> uh, 12 months or so. The, um, uh, and um, so, and, and they, are, they are this. Uh, one is I think we need to um, really secure a more um, robust framework for our principals and uh, making sure that the support uh, is there, that, um, that we have a culture to where w we have the best principal in every single building. We have some really wonderful principals. Um, but I think if we look at ourselves in the mirror, we can't say that we've got great principals in every single building. And there needs to be a framework um, to make that happen. Part of that is a three, 360 evaluation where um, every year parents, teachers, uh, and uh, um, students can participate in the evaluation. Um, I think that uh, we can um, do a better, and, and this is a superintendent's evaluation, but I actually think it's, it's board as well. Um, so we're, we're doing this, we're in it together, and we're gonna succeed together. Uh, we're gonna succeed together. Um, so um, I think the uh, <coughs> providing service to the schools is another area where I think we, should, we can use some improvement. Um, um, we've, and, and I wanna, uh, the other issue is that we had an audit, a high school audit, and, and it talked about um, other districts of similar size and composition doing, um, doing equal or better job with, with less money. Um, and the, the phrase that was used there was fidelity of implementation. Um, and so understanding that. And one of, one of the great, of many things that, that I've seen um, our superintendent lead this district is, is in equity. Uh, and have really built a culture uh, of equity that permeates the whole, um, the whole district. Uh, and you can feel it. And, see it and participate in it, uh, where folks, ev everybody's focused on every single kid, regardless of race um, or where they come from. And I want to see uh, the same kind of culture in terms of the fidelity of implementation and, and management. Uh, and that needs to build up over time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, my last. Uh, place where um, that I want to focus on is making sure that um, that the CTE uh, programs expand and that they're they're done right and that we also deal with um, with lifting the cap on Benson. So my my focus is is moving forward, um, and I'm looking forward to working with you uh, over the course of the next months to make it all happen. Director Buell? Sure, no, go ahead. Did you say yes? Yes. We've had some real successes in the past 18 months. The bond measure, expansion and immersion programs, some terrific work in our high schools, Roosevelt, Jefferson, and Franklin particularly. And Superintendent Smith is well liked and approachable. Even though I'm often in disagreement with the majority of the board, she treats me well and listens to what I think. I really appreciate that. 
but I can't vote for the evaluation as written. While there are many reasons for this, I'm only going to outline three and one other concern. First, we take way too long in addressing obvious problems. Instead of solving them, they are left to fester and become bigger problems than they need to be. Negotiations, which dragged out for 10 months, is the most obvious example of this. Everyone in the audience can probably name several more. Second, we still do not have the mindset and will to involve parents and teachers up front in our decision-making processes. Somehow we don't get it. The idea that honest community and employee involvement can enhance decision-making, not impede it. Third, we aren't addressing in a competent manner the serious problems surrounding our middle grades. Children are paying too high a price for this oversight. There is also my concern about the difficulty in distinguishing whether actions, which I deem errors, are the superintendent's herself or her reaction to directions from the school board majority or co-chairs. Backroom business. I'm not there to see it, so I can't fully evaluate it. Thank you. Okay. Others? Dr. Atkins, go ahead. Um, I'll just I'll try to be fairly brief. Again, I think um, as Director Curler said, the evaluation speaks for itself, and thank you to everyone who worked on putting that together, and to everybody. Um, so, I mean, my comment just goes back to kind of my history in this district, and um, starting as a parent in 1996, and going from there into volunteering in PTA and, and so forth and so on until here we are today, and looking forward to working with you, continuing to work with you. So, um, you know, really when I was elected uh, to the board in 2007, the first major thing, and you could argue the major thing of the entire two terms I've been on, almost two terms I've been on the board, was the decision to hire Carol Smith to lead this district. Um, we, had, we had many options. And we listened to the community about what was the right fit for this city, and we talked amongst ourselves and waited very carefully, and we made absolutely the best possible decision we could have made um, for this district and for this city. And so I will always be proud of that as a decision, um, the key decision um, during my service as uh, on the board along with the, my colleagues at the time. So I think it's easy to underestimate and undervalue the caliber of leadership that Carol brings to this district. Obviously, this doesn't mean that the district is perfect, far from it. There's, we, we've heard several things tonight. We're going to continue to work on a myriad of issues. But and when you look at the big picture, which is what our job is, as well as to attend to all the myriad of details as best we can and respond to them, um, the momentum and the forward motion and the transformation of the culture and achievement in this district um, has just been amazing. And again, I feel like sometimes we take for granted um, that we have had a leader of the, of the caliber of Carol for this district to take on the challenges um, that she has on our behalf and on our kids' behalf. So I'm really grateful for that. And knowing that we do still have so much to accomplish, I'm really looking forward to, um, again, as soon as we get through this, the school year and we pass our budget, we're going to move into um, summer work and, and priority setting and working together on what we're going to try to accomplish and what we're going to tackle and focus on in the, in the year to come. So I'm very excited for that work and just thrilled um, to continue to be working with you, Carol. I've been uh, busy looking through my notes because I had written up some lovely remarks, but they are gone. <laughs> so, oh well, I'll share them with you privately. Um, so I can't believe that you are starting into your eighth year. It's pretty remarkable. And um, I don't think we can um, overestimate or overstate how uh, important it is for an urban school district to have steady leadership um, because I think there's so many times in urban districts where you start down a path and uh, the superintendent changes, the board changes, something happens and all of a sudden you're moving in a different direction. Um, so I think what I have appreciated most about um, your seven plus years with us um, is, um, is your stability and your focus on students and student needs. I think there are uh, many, many times when I see um, your past in terms of your 25 years or so supporting um, underserved students and uh, students who have ended up, landed somehow um, in uh, our community-based alternative school programs. Um, 
I, I can see that coming through in your in your caring, your wanting to do well by all kids. So, um, and I think that the fact that we've done our courageous conversations in such a deep way is a reflection of your work with kids who aren't necessarily making it in in our current traditional school environment. Um, and we have to figure that out and figure out how to help them make it. Um, so um, I was supportive of delaying the your evaluation because there were two big things that I was looking at this year in terms of what I wanted to see us accomplish. One was the uh, successful negotiations with our teachers union and while it was a long and arduous process, when I think about what we accomplished for our kids, I'm pretty happy. Um, we have more instructional days, we have um, you know, more teachers in our building. I mean, there's just so many things around that contract that were, that were good and very positive. At the same time, I think it's very clear that we have to repair relations with our uh, union that represents um, our teachers, uh, the long, our largest uh, workforce. Um, and so I'm looking forward to kind of figuring out how we, how we do that and how we go about it. Um, but I think that's a, a critical to do going forward. And um, the sooner we can kind of almost start working on the next contract, the better. Um, to try to help us see if we can get through that in a, a different and more collaborative and, uh, way. Um, I think we all want what's best for kids, um, and it shouldn't take almost getting to a strike to get there. Um, so I'm actually really pleased with how, where we finally landed it, but it was a really painful process for everybody involved, I believe. Um, and the other thing is I wanted to be able to see where we're, how we're doing with our graduation rates. I mean, in the end, that's what matters. Um, are we successfully graduating kids and are they ready for college and career? And um, especially in this uh, next uh, budget that we're, you're proposing, uh, there's a huge focus on college and career ready um, and a huge emphasis, um, you know, starting from uh, pre-K all the way on up to kind of help our kids get there. So, you know, the fact that our graduation continues to rise is very exciting. I think uh, we're a point behind the state at this point, and I think the reason that Not the state, the reason that the state uh, rose at all, is probably because Portland Public Schools graduation rates rose. Um, but clearly, it's another area like the contract where we have so far to go still, um, and again, important to have some steady leadership um, as we go and have a board that's working uh, with you. Um, when I think a lot of people know that I'm not particularly pleased with how we function as a board. Um, I don't think we're nearly as engaged and as involved as we need to be with you in leading this district. Um, I think the fact that we don't have our committees and the rest um, has been a huge miss as far as this board is concerned, and I've, I'm, not, I'm clearly not in the majority in terms of feeling that, but um, I loved the way we used to work together more than I like now. I feel out of the loop as a board member. And um, I don't think that's healthy for our community. So uh, that would be my ask is to have you step in and kind of help us figure out how to lead with you um, in a much more substantive way uh, than we currently are. Um, let's see if there's anything else. I think you need a raise. <laughs> 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 um, and, and I think that that's something we're going to be Talk about talking about at another meeting. Um, but when I think about where you came in, you didn't have big district experience, and you do now. And we're lucky um, to have you. Um, and uh, when you see other districts around the state that are paying their superintendents far more than what we are paying you, you realize there's a mess there. We've got to figure that one out as we go. And we have to do it in a way that's you know, uh, aware of what our budget can allow for. But at the same time, um, I, I think that's something that we have, to, we have to make some adjustments for. And I think that we're all kind of looking at that. And we're going to figure out how to, how to get there. So we appreciate that over all these years, you've kind of stepped aside and said, nope, now's not the time for a race. But at some point, we need to make that adjustment. and. Uh, I'm happy to step into that conversation. So um, so my big thing, I think, is that I would like us as a board to be working 
far more closely with you in leading the district than we've had the opportunity to since we've given up our committee. So, um, and I, I look forward to that if, if we can get there. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, kind of the main theme of um, the evaluation um, as we went through is um, a real appreciation from uh, the majority of the board of that the focus and steady, sh letter, steady leadership that you've provided um, has provided the district with a lot of positive momentum. Um, and we want to continue that momentum, and we still feel a great sense of urgency um, because there are still lots of students that need our support, um, and we aren't where we want to be. So um, I just want to start with saying thank you for your service to this district. Um, you are, uh, my experience of you has been a selfless leader. Um, there are lots of different kinds of leaders um, that we find in superintendents throughout the country. Some are flashy, some are um, focused on one or two things, um, some seem to go with whatever the wind is taking them. There's a wide variety and you have been really focused on your core issues and the issues that the board has brought and you've been able to maintain that steady leadership um, and I think we're beginning to see the, the, the benefits. I, when I first joined the board three years ago, um, everybody was celebrating a really big gain in graduation rates. And while I celebrated, I also said, you know, um, one year, I don't want to say it's easy, but one year is one year. I wanted to see trend data. Um, and now that I've been here three years, we are moving absolutely in the right direction. It's been consistent. You don't want to see big spikes because it usually causes a red flag. It means something, something was wrong. Um, you want to see steady growth. And knowing that each cohort of kids is a different group of kids, you're going to see some fluctuation. Um, but I've just really appreciated that steady leadership that it's, um, I don't want to say slow and steady because there's an urgency. Every group of kids we only have for a limited amount of time. Um, but our growth and our improvement has been steady. And it's been really exciting um, to be a part of that. And I appreciate your leadership in that. Um, I also want to say that um, we get lots of input from folks about how superintendent's doing, how we're doing, how their school's doing, how the teacher's doing, how the PE teacher's doing, how the dogs in the park are doing. Um, we get lots of feedback. Um, and I just want to let you know that um, this past year, uh, what I've heard more often is people, send, people see me and they pull me aside and they just want to say, you know, I have to say that Portland Public Schools this year is in a better position than all, and some of them have kids that are graduating or have graduated in the 12 years, the 15 years, the 20 years that I've been involved in this district. And that doesn't happen by mistake. It happens by you working with your staff, working with the board to make sure that we are headed in a direction to see that growth. So again, I want to pass that on. People get to share that with me. I want to pass that on to you. Um, and some things that I've appreciated your work. One, um, Director Curler mentioned it before, um, you're focused steady steady hand on equity um, just mathematically speaking um, our graduation rates would improve dramatically if we could get the students who have historically not been served by our district to raise their graduation rates um, that's not to say that we're going to ignore that's why it's every student not just certain students but your focused um, attention on equity making sure it's been a long you know I um, I get to see the history, people who have been involved in the district for this year, back in the 70s, Director Buell, last time you were on the board, equity was desegregation. Um, this has been a constant and persistent um, problem uh, with our educational system, and I just have appreciated your steady leadership in stepping into that. So thank you for that. Um, and I'm not going to list all the things that I see that, um, that give me excitement that you're with us and that you're willing to stay with us. Um, but I will mention a couple successful um, bond work um, last year um, in the summer. Um, people talk about our equity um, work not paying off, but yet if you look at half of our comprehensive high schools, race is no longer a predictor. That is significant work. That doesn't, again, just happen overnight. Um, and in fact, the gap, um, our racial gap between kids on track has narrowed by 10, or excuse me, yeah, it's been narrowed by 10 points. That, that is significant movement. Um, contract, while it was tough getting there, I, don't, I can't think of a time when a superintendent has spent four months literally at the table. I know we get a lot of flag about, oh, the superintendent had been there earlier. I don't know how a superintendent spends four months at the table 
letting things go when you have a district of this size to run. So I just want to thank you for that commitment. Um, and the, the piece that I like about it is that it's a better contract for kids. One side didn't win, one side didn't lose. The teams were focused on what's best for kids and how do we get to a solution. And your willingness to be in there working on solutions for hours on end um, is a direct result. Um, we get to benefit from that, so thank you. Um, I'll mention equity and contracting policies, affirmative action. I mean, these are things, long-standing things that this district has not made movement on. And again, it, it works to this historically underserved populations that we just haven't been, we haven't been a friend to. Um, we haven't served them well, so I appreciate that. I, there's 11, 11 different community engagement, community process, community groups that um, I just came up with off the top of my head that you're engaged in. When I hear people say, you don't do enough community input and you don't have it, we have community engagement in lots of places and you are intimately involved with each of those, so thank you. And I'll um, end with two, two pieces. One, um, you continue to look for budget savings, so we put over $3 million of savings from boiler conversions, from um, recovery bond projects that then go directly to the classroom. And again, it's you and your staff looking for ways to do that. Um, and then finally, I'll just say that um, Again, another place where your steady focused leadership of high school redesign, um, that w you set out a plan, it was controversial. Some people still, communities still feel slighted by it and I understand that. Um, but somebody mentioned the Benson cap, we revisited, we were able to revisit that today because the plan that you had put in place, the one that you came to, that you heard the community with, um, is beginning to work. So we were able to lift that cap, raise it slightly without hurting our neighborhood comprehensive. That's significant, and I understand people's urgency about wanting it to happen faster, um, but what we do to one part of this system hap has an effect on other parts of the system, and you have been really steady about trying to be responsive and making sure that you know that every kid in every building deserves an equal chance, and you're not willing to sacrifice that for, uh, to the benefit of some. Um, I'll stop there again I could go on <laughs> I'm just really excited um, and I couldn't be more pleased with your performance and thank you for your work and I agree with Bobby we need to find a way to to bring your compensation in line with um, with not only this state but also across the country thank you thank you yeah. representative Davidson so I think most people have actually said all that I want to say, but I'll try and touch on some of those things Sorry. and add in some other stuff as well. No, it was all great stuff. Uh, I'm excited about the future. I mean, I think uh, everyone pointed out that you've done a fantastic job as superintendent of this district. I think as a student, I can definitely see where we're progressing. And I think we still do have a lot of challenges ahead of us and none of us will disagree with that. But I feel excited about it. Um, and I'm excited because I think that if we continue it with the rate we're going and with you as our superintendent, not only will we overcome our challenges, but we'll be stronger because of it. And I think we'll come out even better than before. Um, a few things that I've been really impressed with is I think that as far as superintendents go, especially of large districts, you've been able to understand the uniqueness of our community. Um, a lot of times you see districts trying to replicate things from other places that seem to be working. I think you've done a fairly good job of understanding what will work here and modifying things for us. Um, and also, you seem to understand the term of investments, which sometimes people get confused about, about how education truly is based on investments. But I can see here that we're making the right decisions for the long term, that it's not just about seeing results instantly over one or two years, but sometimes it's you know, over a decade when you start to really see differences. Um, I appreciate the grace with which you handle your job. I mean, it's really, really impressive. I mean, <laughs> we don't really realize it here as much, but sometimes just for fun, do you ever just look at other districts and what their boards are doing? It's like, wow, you know, we're in a good place. <laughs> so, uh, yes, we are. And, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, and really that selflessness that Director Belisle talked about. I mean, sometimes I just try and beat your car here actually sometimes early in the morning or late at night. I try and see if I'm the, the only one here, but it, it's never the case. You're always here. Uh, and I think that, you know, even with scheduling things like Steve said, anytime we want to approach you, you're always willing. I've never had you say, no, I can't meet with you. That's, that's never been a thing. You always fit, find time for us and make us priority. So I appreciate that. Um, and I, I do think Director Regan said something that I completely agree with, that we need to find a better way to support you. And I think the committee system is a, a thing, something we definitely need to look at uh, for the future. So just thank you for all that you do, and I'm really excited. So thank you. Thank you. 
So Director Morton couldn't be here tonight and um, sent his comments, so I'm going to just read those uh, into the record. Um, so these are from him. I'm disappointed to miss this evening's vote on Superintendent Smith's performance evaluation. I apologize to both my board colleagues and the superintendent for my absence. Hiring and evaluating the superintendent is one of the most critical pieces of work we do as a board, as it is her leadership in partnership with the board that plays a key role in setting the direction of the district. I'm sure more than one of my colleagues has already outlined district outcomes worthy of praise, increases in graduation rates, reductions in our most persistent achievement gaps, sustained and authentic community engagement, strategic investments that show positive results, and the list goes on. What we've done over the last year and many years prior, what, Super Smith has, what Superintendent Smith has led her staff to do is a wonderful example of what we can collectively accomplish even in the midst of financially anemic, drastically underfunded system when we have a leader who provides both stability and vision. That is what Superintendent Smith has offered us as she has served the 48,000 students in our district. Of course, her work and our work is nowhere near complete, an enrollment-driven system, one that relies too much on the number of students in each school rather than the resources necessary to build a rigorous, relevant system for our increasingly diverse student population, regardless of their zip code. We find too many inequities, too many missed opportunities, and too many of our most vulnerable students falling through the cracks and disappearing into hopelessness. Superintendent Smith knows this too, and I trust her leadership will continue to guide us down a path meeting and exceeding our milestones, offering an example of educational excellence for both our state and other urban school districts around the country. This will continue to be an enormous task, and I encourage all stakeholders, students, parents, teachers, administrators, and the 80 percenters to join the superintendent and the board in this work. Be critical, be thoughtful, and be present. Our superintendent's leadership offers us a unique opportunity to build upon our collective talents. Let's take advantage of this while we have the privilege to ride the momentum of her lit that her leadership has made possible. And Carol, finally, thank you for providing us with an example of leadership that confirms the importance of, importance of balance and kindness, listening and thoughtful action. These unsung traits have acted as a foundation for our district to build key partnerships, act on important stakeholder input, and drive calculated decisions to improve opportunity for each student in our district. Thank you for your work, Carol, and thank you for your leadership. So, now. Yeah. the thoughtfulness with which you um, prepared and delivered your feedback and your remarks um, both um, prior to tonight and tonight and um, just that it was really wonderful to get to sit and listen to all of you reflect uh, and it is and to have all of you here hearing it um, and being part of it but I just it's with great joy that I get to do the job that I do and there are frequently people who stop me on the street and go oh my goodness how do you do that job and I truly love this job, and I love the work we get to do together, and I love that we are doing what we do to make things better for kids in this district. So thank you all for your board members and staff and community for your partnership in doing that work together. Great. It brings me joy. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right. more, more happiness. <laughs> Okay, we will, the board will now consider resolution 4914, the superintendent's performance appraisal, appraisal excuse me, for 2014. Do I have a motion and a second? Second. Director Belisle moves and Director Atkins seconds the adoption of resolution 4914. Ms. Hewson, is there any public comment? There is not. Okay, and we've already had our board discussion. The board will now vote well, on resolution. Question. Did you have another? I have a another question comment? about this. Uh, uh, Director Buell? The resolution, we're voting on something that's upstairs in a drawer. What's that? The, well, the, we're voting on a performance appraisal, but we don't have any copies of it or see what we're voting on. It's the same one we did. 
Right. So you should have a copy at your dais, and it's available for public review. Is it up there? Public or, review. Do we put it out, lay it out for people or anything I like that? I don't know, but it's available Didn't for public review at any request. Oh, the, uh, is this, did we make any changes from when we talked about it? No. No, we did not. So it was an identical thing. Yes. And yes. That, um, but we don't, we're not going to have it for it's people. It's available for public review. If it's not up on the website right now, it will be before the end of the meeting. Yeah, it'd probably be a good okay. idea. No, not any okay. Other, any but other comments? I don't have any other comments. Great. No. Okay. Idea. So the board will now vote on resolution 4914. All in favor, please uh, indicate by saying call, yes. Please? All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Just wait a minute. All opposed, please indicate by saying no. No. Any abstentions? Okay, Director Buell's asked for a roll call vote, so I will do that. Director Atkins? Yes. Director Regan? Yes. Director Belisle? Yes. Director Kerler? Yes. Director Buell? No. And Student Representative Davidson? Yes. Yes. Okay, resolution and Director Knowles? Yes. <laughs> Director 4914 is approved by a vote of 5 to 1 with Student Representative Davidson voting yes. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. One more round of applause. So the uh, employment contract for the superintendent was also originally on this agenda, but it has uh, been pulled for tonight. <clears throat> and let me uh, give a little bit of an explanation for that. So over the past uh, seven years, Carol has been our superintendent. We've seen, as I said earlier, a 14-point gain in the high school graduation rate and narrowing in the achievement gap between white students and students of color, passage of a capital bond to begin the long road to modernizing our schools, um, passage of a local option levy that provided funding for our schools as we were fighting the effects of a recession that was crippling our efforts to educate every child, and most recently the superintendent led the contract negotiations as Director uh, Regan was speaking about with PAT that among other things resulted in more school days for students and provisions that allow the district to hire sooner and place more competent teachers in front of our students, provisions that the district had sought for many years. Some would say that these accomplishments are the result of, of steady long-term leadership, and it's true that Superintendent has, Smith has been with PPS for seven years, more than double the national average of urban superintendents across the country. And, <clears throat> and longevity does make a difference is there, if there is a strong leader in place, but it is leadership with a laser-like focus on what is best for our children, that is the real determining factor. Superintendent Smith has provided that le leadership and she is nationally recognized for her leadership in this district. In the seven years that Superintendent Smith has been at PPS, her salary has increased 0.2%. In 2007, she started at a significantly lower salary than her predecessor, Vicki Phillips, because of her inexperience as a superintendent in a major school district. During the ensuing recession, the superintendent refused to take any increase while the district was making cuts elsewhere. Although teachers and other employees received steps in COLAs, albeit irregularly, it was only in 2013 that she received her first and only raise, a cost of living raise shared by all administrators. In trying to reset the superintendent's compensation to a level that is fair, that reflects her accomplishments, and that makes PPS competitive in the market to attract and retain superintendents and allows for recalibration for our other employees, the board is considering many things. Among these are the change in the position of the district during her leadership, the experience and longevity of the superintendent, the compensation of other superintendents and their experience levels across the country, and the size and situation of their districts and the current market. We have reviewed many of these things. We're pulling the um, consideration of the contract off of the agenda day so that we have time as a board. We're gonna form a small task force made up of directors Adkins and Regan, who have been our most long-serving board members, um, to review the information that we're able to find about superintendent compensation across this country and in, in the region and in, at the same time considering all the other things that I mentioned. And we'll, we'll be reporting back to the public, um, we hope, by our next board meeting, uh, if not that, the meeting after that with where we are landing on the superintendent's compensation. And at that time, we will um, vote on her contract. So thank you very much for your patience uh, as we uh, consider this. Thanks.
Okay, now we will move to our next um, agenda item, which is inter-district transfers. The board has previously discussed this item at our May 12th meeting. Superintendent Smith, would you like to provide any additional comments? No, you had an extensive discussion about this at our last meeting. Um, Judy Brennan, who's the director of enrollment and transfer um, services, did the presentation last time and is available for questions if people have questions. Okay, we will now consider resolution 4916, 2014 inter-district student transfers. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Director mm -hmm. Atkins moves and Director Kurler seconds the motion to adopt resolution 4916. Ms. Houston, is there any citizen comment on no, this? No, there is not. No. And uh, is there any additional board discussion from what we did last meeting? No. Okay. Director Bilal. Um, I just want to make a couple comments. I'm not going to rehash my comments from last time, but I just want to let folks know that I will not be supporting this resolution um, primarily because um, of some of the issues I discussed last last week, um, primarily at Kelly Elementary, where I feel like we are prioritizing students outside the district over some of our neighborhood schools. So thank you. Other comments? Dr. Atkins. I'll just briefly want to appreciate again um, staff or the folks who weren't able to be at the previous discussion where they laid out kind of the complexities and the challenges with a law that had some unclear provisions and even contradictory pieces to it and um, where the state is still trying to make itself clear about how districts are supposed to carry out this law and we'll probably have to come back to it. So anyway, just to say thank you to the staff for their hard work in making sense of this and coming up with a workable solution and one that's gonna have to be flexible just by necessity um, and one that's really focused on what's best for, for all the, the families that we serve and how we could best move forward. So thanks again to staff. Okay, any other comments? All right, the board will now vote on resolution 4916. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, please indicate by saying no. No. Any abstentions? Four nine one six. You're abstaining. Okay. Four nine one six does not have. Let's see. One, two, three. Here it is. Four. Okay. Four nine one six is approved by a vote of four to one, with and with one abstention. With student representative Davidson voting. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, at this time we move on to our next agenda item, which is the additional criteria for high school ed specs. Again, the board previously discussed this item at its May 12th meeting. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, given the earlier comments, we will have some other discussion. Superintendent Smith, would you like to provide any other comments? Um, yes, I think we actually sort of began the discussion during the um, Bond Advisory Committee, and I'm gonna ask Jim Owens to come on up and um, basically continue the conversation and the dialogue and respond to questions that board members have that may have been generated by that earlier discussion. So Jim Owens. Thank you, Mr. Penn Smith, and good evening, Mr. Board. Okay. First, let's get our resolution on the table before we start a discussion. Okay. We'll now consider resolution 4917, directing amendments to the long-range facility plan, student capacity model, and related comprehensive high school education specifications to include additional criteria. Do I have a motion? That's a, that's a mouthful. So moved. <laughs> second. And a second. Director Blyle moves and Director Atkins seconds the motion mm -hmm. to adopt resolution 4917. Ms. Houston, any citizen comment? We have one. Scott Bailey. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Bailey, you were here and I'm sure you know the rules about public comment, so I'm not going to, yes. to give them again. Thank you, Go ahead. Um, 12, 12 minutes. There was, <laughs> there was actually supposed to be two yeah. of us and one of us is sick, so. No just, six minutes either. <laughs> just, just a <laughs> tiny bit of understanding. So I'm here on uh, behalf tonight of our Portland Our Schools. My name is Scott Bailey. Um, our Portland Our Schools, as you know, is a staunch supporter of the bond. We strongly feel the need for this bond to be successful and for 30 years of bond work so that all our schools are safe for kids and are uh, modernized for 21st century education. Um, we have questions about the proposed 37 million shift in funds. Many of them were raised by Kevin Spellman earlier. 
We don't know uh, what the money exactly is going to. We don't know how the dollar amount was calculated. We um, were unsure of what ed specs are going to be changed, what, what's involved in that. There's just a lot of specifics that aren't out there. Until the board book tonight, apparently there's a little bit of detail about the money, but that's the first that's been out there, and I haven't even seen the board book. Um, the, the use of value engineering seems to be misused, as Mr. Spellman said. So it, it's there's just seems to be no transparency at this point about w where those dollars are going. Um, and it's been suggested publicly that the increase in cost was due to community and teacher pushback. Well, maybe some, but I'm wondering if, if some of it was just that the initial estimates were too low and that once we got into, down into the details that we found out it was going to cost more. And if that's the case, just come out and say it. You know, we know this district hasn't done a high school in, what, 25, 30 years, 40 years, something like that. We know that this is complex. It's a, it's a challenging task. Just be up front with it. These questions also raise some other questions, and it comes back to we have no educational vision driving this like we need. We have no CTE vision. We're having to kind of invent it as we go along in these high schools. The planning timeline appears to be too short. Um, it seems like the education side of the house has not been engaged. And that's a huge, uh, uh, it hasn't helped. And, fr and frankly, some of these are your responsibility and some of these are your responsibility. Uh, there seems to be no structured teacher participation in the bond work. Um, and finally, um, the, the Bond Accountability Committee is only getting its information from staff. It, it needs to reach out more to the rest of the community to get more information. Um, I'd like 30 more seconds just to hit one or two more points, if I could, please. Um, 30. Some details on how the rest of the bond will be impacted are really important. And I want to say, for example, everybody goes back and looks at seismic. The seismic strengthening in terms of the individual schoolwork that's in the bond frankly, from, from our point of view, are, are of marginal value. They don't bring a school up to full protection. They, they help with some uh, making exit of the building easier, but they're not a guarantee. Um, so we should look sp carefully at, at whether that's part that should be kept or not. Uh, Mr. Bailey. Your, your I 30 think seconds my time is up. Is up. In fact, Thanks. It's 45. So thank you so much for okay. being here tonight and providing the comments. Appreciate that. Okay, now we're to board discussion of the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Owens. And maybe just board? staff, I mean, maybe Jim could start by just kind of taking us through what the staff recommendation is and the information. That would be great. Right. Um, thank you. I'm prepared to do that. Um, last Monday, May 12th, C.J. Sylvester, Chief School Modernization, presented a staff report recommending additional criteria for Franklin, Grant, and Roosevelt High School schematic designs and related fiscal impacts. She described the logic, the pros, and the cons, including risk factors, several of which have been highlighted tonight by our Bond Accountability Committee. A resolution is included in tonight's agenda directing staff to develop and bring forward for board adoption amendments to the Long Range Facilities Plan, student capacity model or methodology, and related comprehensive high school ed specs to include the additional high school criteria. Furthermore, she asked that the Board of Education concurrence uh, staff shall proceed, or I should say with Board of Education concurrence, staff shall proceed with the modified schematic designs for Franklin Grant and Roosevelt High Schools, along with related budget increases as were outlined. So at this time, I'd like to um, answer any questions that you may have regarding the resolution in terms of the scope and content of it, and any additional questions you may have regarding the, uh, the projects themselves. Director Bilal. 
So I'm, I'm just repeating some of what was started. How about we start with um, the extra scope? What, what's the change in scope specifically? What are we buying? Um, and then um, whether or not, um, my experience of this has been that uh, as we looked at improved teacher ratios, as we looked at more classes, students taking, which is, has been um, feedback from our community, um, that we've changed some of that scope. So how did we get to where we are? Um, how about we start with that? Okay, uh, great question. Uh, thank you for the uh, trying to get to the essence of what this change is about. Um, I like to think in terms of the projects in terms of three parameters, uh, scope, budget, and schedule. And all three of those, as you know, are interconnected to one another. When you change one element, you impact the others in, in varying ways. Uh, when the bond was developed uh, prior to the November um, election, uh, the size of the schools were uh, planned for a certain student capacity that was based on a student capacity methodology that was developed as part of our uh, long-range uh, school facilities plan. Um, the metric that we used for student capacity was based on square feet per student and was actually aligned with uh, different types of educational spaces. So the planning targets that were developed um, assumed that we would have a capacity of 1,500 students uh, core for the uh, Roosevelt High School, 1,200 uh, classroom capacity, and then 1,500 student capacity classroom and core for, for Franklin and for Grant. Uh, with those numbers, um, we uh, had certain size expectations for the schools, and we made assumptions for how much of it would be new construction, how much of it would be uh, historic rehabilitation. Uh, since that time, the scope of the uh, high schools has increased. Uh, you may recall last year, the size of the uh, schools for uh, Franklin and for Grant increased to 1,700 students, and for uh, Roosevelt, it increased to 1,350 students, classroom, 1,700 core. Uh, that was a significant increase in size. Uh, we subsequently examined criteria around uh, greater student access to, to credits uh, for graduation, and that resulted in being able to address reducing the student-to-teacher ratio, and it looked like it uh, made, um, it makes a lot of sense in terms of criteria to be applied, uh, but that was a second scope increase. So all told, Franklin has increased in size uh, from what originally was envisioned by about 20 percent in terms of overall uh, square footage. Uh, with size comes comes cost. And so as the cost estimates were developed, uh, particularly since we've been able to move into the uh, schematic design phase and we have both our design team and our uh, builders, uh, recall that we selected our construction manager or general contractors uh, for both the Roosevelt and the Franklin project. In collaboration with staff, uh, they updated the budget estimates and so what was presented in CJ's report last week is what the additional cost was, uh, was uh, providing. Um, I can summarize by saying, um, in addition to the uh, additional $46 million, uh, it's broken out in terms of where it would be uh, identified in the program. Uh, as I think Kevin Spellman mentioned, the bond program is a, uh, is a fixed uh, face value amount. And so as we look at moving, uh, as we look at project scopes, we have to align budgets with them. So we were looking at uh, identifying additional funds for uh, future projects, uh, specifically the uh, summer improvement projects, uh, and really it was represented as a postponement uh, because the uh, funding was uh, specifically identified to be uh, somewhat offset by other items that may uh, provide us an opportunity later, such as the uh, bond premium which is an additional amount that we don't currently have access to, but it could be potentially brought to bear. Uh, we'll know more uh, in, about that in a, in a year from now. Uh, we're also looking at a, a different approach to how the uh, escalation uh, component, which is another contingency line item in the bond program, might be allocated for scope increase. And then finally, as we had dis discussed previously, $10 million from the uh, program reserve uh, 10 million of the 20 million that's that's identified that as you know is uh, is uh, allocated based on board discretion and so uh, an argument was made that uh, half of that would be used to identify this the scope increase 
uh, schedule impacts at this point um, have uh, not uh, are, are being impacted um, as you'll hear when uh, staff presents the quarterly update at the uh, May 27th meeting we'll identify what uh, what this does to our balance scorecard um, effectively it puts our schedules uh, very much at risk for the uh, Franklin project and the Roosevelt project so that's a long way of around explaining uh, in part what what right. is uh, obtained with the additional funding and the impact that it has on scope and schedule. Thank you. A qu a, uh, I hope a quick follow-up. I don't know if it's quick or not, but my part will be quick. Um, so they, the Bond Accountability Committee reminded us, Kevin reminded us, that um, the long-range facility plan really said that building your way out of a capacity issue is the most expensive way. That we would, that the long-range facility plan would just say try to use other levers such as boundary review or something like that um, to do that and so I'm sure staff has done some um, we couldn't take 200 students out of Franklin that's not enough to open another high school but they could be re reassigned perhaps to another high school was that considered and um, can you talk to me a little bit about the trade-offs or what was the thinking about that we, we have not evaluated I'm, the I'm, office of school modernization staff has not okay. uh, studied that uh, operational aspect uh, because we could be at this point right looking at this and value engineering and saying wow we're really out of budget it looks like we have to bring us back down to 1500 to fit within the budget we have that, fact, if that we could don't go with option. a larger scope in budget that right. would be something that staff would need to evaluate okay. <coughs> questions uh, director Atkins could you speak um, give a little more detail about the value engineering piece and what that includes what that entails value engineering is a industry term that uh, involves a uh, design team and builder uh, team effort to look at the work scope and uh, connect the contractor means and methods and uh, identify how the uh, designer intends to to do the design itself and to identify areas where uh, price reductions can be achieved uh, VE goes value engineering for short goes in both directions uh, VE can result in increased cost uh, also in uh, decreased cost. In the case of both uh, Roosevelt uh, and Franklin, uh, the VE netted out as an increase. However, there was a significant effort. Uh, initially, the teams found that the cost was significantly higher. And so they actually were able to bring it down from what it might have been to the numbers that we're, uh, we're presenting now. The only numbers you've seen, of course, are, is the combination of the three high schools unless we not forget uh, Grant High School is uh, being included in this as well. So the effort that the Roosevelt and the Franklin teams went through was to look at the full scope, look at uh, uh, building systems and try to uh, make it as efficient as possible. Again, based on input from the uh, general contractor, based on input from the designer and the owner. Uh, we did make an effort to try to stay on the program that had been approved in the uh, educational specifications for comprehensive high schools. And so with that, the uh, team primarily focused on what we would call fit and finish changes, mm -hmm. uh, building envelope materials, uh, mechanical electrical plumbing systems, uh, a comprehensive look at all of the scope uh, in the work. Uh, but we, we worked uh, very hard to maintain the program as it's identified in the uh, educational specifications. Um, one of the uh, potential uh, uh, one additional area of analysis would be to start uh, reducing program uh, because reducing program will also result in reducing cost and reducing program examples are uh, eliminating the auxiliary gym for example uh, reducing the size of cafeterias uh, narrowing the corridors uh, reducing the size of classrooms those are programmatic type issues that uh, we certainly would be uh, able to look at more more fully so just to follow on that so was the net um proposed increase for the value engineering, is that mainly related to the change in the scope and the increase of classrooms and the size, or a separate discussion just about the fit and finishes and longevity and the quality that that the designers and, and architects felt we needed, or is it a combination it, of the two? It was actually a combination. It was um, the, the chronology of these changes, of course, have occurred over a relatively short period of time, and really I'm going back to the master plan approvals from mm -hmm. uh, December of 2013. So with the, uh, with the planning that went into identifying the scope uh, and the budget changes to go to the larger sizes for the 1,700 uh, student capacity, for example, uh, very quickly then we also started to study the impact for additional uh, classrooms. 
and so all of that was taken on together. So wh where we are currently in, in terms of the financial information that was presented last week is that's, that's the accumulation uh, for all of it. If we were to go uh, back to the reduced size, then obviously that would have an impact on the, on the budgets. But there's also a component of it that is just around further study of the, of the finishes and materials as well? We pretty much have run that uh, as tightly as possible. I, mm -hmm. There's very, very little opportunity to drive that further. And, and of course, each school is, is different. Um, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're about to present the schematic design recommendations for Franklin High School, which is uh, about a month ahead of Roosevelt High School right now. Uh, Roosevelt High School is currently going through extensive value engineering and although I uh, have a certain amount of confidence in hitting the targets that we've established, we, we still have several weeks to go before we can have, uh, have more comfort. Um, I don't feel comfortable as the executive director of OSM coming forward with a schematic design recommendation uh, to you unless I have a sense of confidence that we can build it on time, on budget. and per the uh, schedule, and so right now the schedule uh, component is, is putting an uh, enormous amount of pressure on being able to make, to be able to make these changes and then uh, still stay on our schedule, which for both high schools, as, as we know, is for the fall of 2017. Others? Director Buell? The bond accountability people say they don't know where $36 million is going. Is that because you haven't told them or because you don't know too? I, I do know. I have not briefed the Bond Accountability Committee. You haven't it told them? Where, did, to where, is it, where is it going? Uh, planning to brief them on, on the individual projects this Friday right. when we go over the schematic design review for Franklin. And, and then they'll know where the $36 million is going and have a deal on it? Where, where is the $36 million they'll, going? They'll have an understanding of, of how it's being uh, allocated and what the scopes are specifically that relate to it. So we'll be going uh, into detail with them relative to the, uh, the programmatic elements in terms of what the uh, dollars per square feet costs are for the building hard costs and site costs. We'll do a, a fairly deep dive so that they can have an understanding of, of how the funds are being, being allocated. I think what, um, what Kevin Spellman uh, presented tonight was um, questioning the, uh, the use of some of the bond funds that weren't intended for scope changes. For example, the use of escalation uh, as a bond program category was intended for escalation uh, inflation purposes, not for scope changes. Uh, we also identified use of uh, borrowing, if you will, from future uh, bond projects, uh, the summer work, uh, to be used for the high schools. That also was not originally envisioned. So part of the conversation that needs to take, take place with the Bond Accountability Committee is, is more uh, more visibility in terms of how staff develop these these numbers. So we have the uh, we have an increase in the in the uh, square foot costs. Is that a huge chunk of that thirty six million? We do have an increase. We didn't in figure the, that out, or that's we'll new, or we'll actually uh, show the information that led to uh, how that how that changed over time since since the bond uh, uh, passed in in uh, the fall of uh, twenty twelve. Of course, we've seen. Uh, inflation occur. We've seen increase in costs of construction materials, and so we're trying to account for that by uh, allocating escalation uh, to these projects. We didn't account for that in the beginning. I mean, I could have told you probably, and I'm stupid on this stuff, but I could have told you that the costs of materials are going to increase. Right. Well, we Guess what? They're going to increase in two years down the line, we too. We did do we, that. We did take that into account. But we didn't do it enough? Or well, no. Again, that was intended for not for scope changes, that was intended for uh, cost changes in terms of materials, cost of labor, and the like. We had a program level component uh, escalation that we uh, identified $45 million uh, to spread across the bond uh, projects over an eight year period. So we've been allocating the escalation to the summer projects, uh, to our other projects like Fabian, like uh, the, the two high schools uh, currently and doing it in a way that allows us to keep track of the changes in the, in the uh, square footage costs. So, the, so we didn't estimate enough for the changes in the square footage costs? We, yes, we, we, in my opinion, we estimated enough for escalation. What we didn't estimate for was scope increase. 
So the scope increase in terms of how large we, uh, we build these schools was not uh, assumed to be larger than what was in the bond measure. So you got a little, so when you build the escalade, the, you build the new stuff, then you've got an increase there too? In other words, it, the, you've got, you're now building the, the changes in the scope with a higher. Right, so we, so Franklin uh, High School, for example, has grown by 20% in terms of the total square footage of the building, uh, of the buildings of the, of the site. So Did, with that a, comes added cost because it's, it's bigger than it was intended. And with the cost, built. they build in escalation. Mm -hmm. So that what they're asking for us to do, they're, they're saying yes, to build Franklin, it will continue to increase. So what we need to build Franklin has both the cost to build and the anticipated increase, which then further reduces what we have available. Is that what you're asking, I think, Director Buell? Probably not, but it's thank you for the explanation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and I, th I think uh, it's what? important to note that the changes in scope have been changes in scope that the board has approved. Mm -hmm. So that's, it, it's, it's on us, right? So did we, if we're adding things, classes, Classroom. And we, we have not, yeah, classrooms, several classrooms. We have not looked to see what we should decrease yet. Is that what you're saying? That's what I got out of what you said. In other words, you got these huge foyers. And when I've looked at those, I'm going, it's a pretty big foyer. So if we cut the foyer down, we haven't thought about that yet. Or we've, if we've got, we're adding 12 classrooms, we no longer need as many uh, teacher uh, stations outside of the classroom. No, we, we have identified where we have opportunities to, uh, to resize, to, to reshape, to, to make smaller in some instances. Fundamentally, though, when we add the number of classrooms that we're adding, and with additional classrooms comes extended learning areas, uh, teacher uh, workstation areas, uh, increase in common spaces, it, it all proportionally increases. So the, the net effect on the project is uh, increased, uh, increased space a total square footage, if you will, and with that comes increased cost. But we haven't really subtracted, figured out, have we figured out a, a, some sort of a proposal to decrease the space in other places? We've, we've looked at decreasing and have done Just quite a bit of that it. in the case of Franklin and in the case of Roosevelt, we're still in the process of... That doesn't show up in this resolution or is it going to show up when we make the resolution? This resolution is actually independent of the budgets for the uh, for the projects. These, this resolution specifically identifies uh, looking at the student capacity methodology that was in our long range facilities plan and also uh, modifying the comprehensive high school educational specifications to resize the, the program. And by program, I'm referring to the educational spaces, um, their, their sizes, their configurations, the different features to the spaces. For example, what does a classroom look like in a Portland Public School comprehensive high school? There are certain physical characteristics to it that we're accounting for, and, and this plan that we have allows us to, uh, to construct to, to meet the requirements of the educational specification. And the grant? The, the grant high school money that's part of this kind of resolution. It, are we adding classrooms to grant too? We are. We actually are using the Franklin model for grant uh, because they're very similar. So we replicated the planning around uh, Franklin uh, to, to the grant uh, site. So grant though is several years out and so we'll continue to monitor that. but. We were very deliberate to ensure that all three of the high schools are being accounted for in terms of the increased scopes. Go ahead. Somebody yes, else? somebody else. Great. Thank you, Steve. Director Curler. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, it, so the the bond accountability committee had a host of things that they were concerned about. Some of it was just not understanding, it, and they were just didn't understand. Um, so kind of the maybe the definition of value engineering because I was confused too so I just thought value engineering means cost going to go down um, but but uh, but I have, I have a process question because you're going to brief them on Friday I'm uncomfortable um, we're, we're counting on the bond accountability committee uh, in a lot of ways um, and so I there's some uncomfort even though I, I actually think what we're going to do in the high schools, I'm supportive of. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, from a process standpoint, 
I want to have before you come before we do a resolution to have the bond accountability committee be fully briefed and they might raise issues um, th that neither you nor ourselves have thought about um, do, do you have a problem with um, waiting until they're fully briefed before coming to us <laughs> the next um, time that staff was coming before you was to present the schematic design for Franklin High School um, I'm hesitant I, I certainly agree and certainly from a transparency standpoint we intend we want to brief the bond accountability committee on the details of it but we um, we also have these schedules um, that we're on and um, however as as a board you you choose if you want to delay that um, I guess uh, I would caution that uh, our ability to deliver Franklin on our current schedule um, uh, is already jeopardized and, and that may be okay I just I feel a responsibility to indicate what the uh, impacts are if, if it takes uh, more more time to, to go through this and so in the case of uh, briefing the bond accountability committee absolutely we're doing that this Friday and if you would prefer for me to come back again to talk about what what they learned from the briefings I'm happy to do that so I mean I don't when's our next board meeting? Well, let, let's get all of our comments down before okay. we make okay. those well, kinds of decisions okay well it was a, it's a question that right. I have right when's when, our next meeting yeah uh, next 27 27, 27. Which is the which is when the Franklin uh, recommendation is, is coming forward. So uh, so is seven days significant in your in your view? In significant in terms of being able to brief the bond accountability committee. Uh, no, we we can no, no, significant for us to not <coughs> wait for that to happen. Okay. Well, what's significant is um, the way it's currently configured and. The way the schematic design is laid out if we're going to change that that's significant uh, if we're going to reduce the size of it back to what it was in the bond for example as a 1500 student capacity uh, high school that that's a very significant change if we go to the middle uh, the middle uh, plan it's a, a 1700 uh, student capacity high school so we have the ability to, to make those changes it's just as we get as we get further into June and, and perhaps into July, it starts to put pressure on our ability to proceed with the balance of the design. Remember, this is just the very early part of the design and then plan the construction and already our schedules are telling us that we're extremely tight in being able to have that work completed. I'm not sure if that answered your question ability, but it's. Okay. Director Atkins. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I think um, last week I, I was feeling um, heartburn, but was willing to proceed based on the staff's recommendation and knowing that this is um, this is where we were, and the fact that um, the board has already made the decision and voted to increase the size to 1,700. I mean, I, th I think it's important that we recognize that, and that we not um, get further contribute to the the delays and and um, prolonging of this before we can move forward by us then deciding to change our mind and then do something we've already done. That said, it gives me a lot of pause when our bond accountability committee does not have the information and is not in support. So that's, that, that, that escalates my heart into a, a new level, speaking of escalation. So um, um, I'm, you know, again, it's the continual, it just feels like this board has, has done more than its fair share of contributing to this delay and I'm really, really concerned about that. Um, and it's hard for me to, I think the seven, to me, the 1700 decision has, has been made and given the growth in the district and what we've learned over this period of time, I think we need to stick with that. That would be my opinion at this point. Um, in terms of the extended scope and the additional classroom spaces and all that piece, I'm still, um, you know, again, based on the staff recommendation, willing to support that because if we are learning through this and we are finding out what, what is needed in order to build the high schools the way we need them to be built. Um, but again, it just gives me significant pause when our experts are saying they don't support that and that we can't afford to do that. Um, and as, as Carol was mentioning, does that mean that we end up doing something less than for these first two schools and then have a revised estimate going forward for the future ones? Um, 
So I'm just interested in hearing what other folks have to say because this is a this is a real dilemma. But the most important thing to me is that we keep moving forward on this and that we not create additional um, create additional right. delays. So I'm not sure if the additional you know you you would need the certainty that the decision next week, right before as you came with the schematic design and support the schematic design you've been directed to create. So that puts you in a uh, very difficult, uh, you already are in a difficult position, it makes it more difficult. Um, so I'm not sure you know, where, that, where that leaves us. Again, I just feel like we need to take account the accountability as a board for the decisions we've already made that's sort of set this in motion. Just to have a quick question, uh, Jim. We're still, the, 17, the, the increase of the 1,700 student capacity was the first change. This change has to do with program, and it's still for 1,700 students. Isn't that correct? Yes. Same number of students, it's just programming changes. Actually, the answer to that is, is somewhat complicated. Um, <laughs> by, 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 adding, by adding classroom, adding space, um, you're increasing student capacity. Um, however, you're also providing uh, more opportunities with having additional classrooms for students, and you're reducing the student-to-teacher ratio. So there's a, there's a, a cost-benefit uh, analysis, if you will, associated with that. So um, although notionally the 1,700 student capacity, and, and again, it's using the model that's in our long-range plan that this resolution before you will actually have staff go back and reevaluate and change, and change the capacity methodology. Uh, again, our, our method is, is a function of number of square feet per student in different types of educational mm -hmm. space. So what we are planning to do is to go back and look at that. Uh, and ultimately, 1,700 would be what I think the, the uh, modified methodology would need, to, would need to reflect. So it's not our intention to have the schools be more than 1,700 students. Is that a fair statement? Under our current model, they are larger than 1,700. Pardon me? Under our current model, with this additional, with these additional classrooms, they actually deliver more than 1,700 students. No, but what we're considering, the change, is what I'm asking you. Then if we go if back, at the end of the change, then we would. If we adopted what we have in front of us today, then we're still talking about 1,700 students. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Um, the, the document, the resolution before you. Uh, ask staff to go back and reevaluate the capacity methodology, one. And two, it's asking staff to go and modify the comprehensive high school educational specifications, specifically the area program part that addresses how many uh, classrooms, how many square feet per different types of educational space. So we, we have to go back and, and do that. Uh, Kevin Spellman mentioned having the source documents precede the the programmatic changes in the bond. Mm -hmm. So it's really going back to align those documents right. with the work that we're doing. But it's, um, I, I can't give you a clear answer in terms of what, what that will do in terms of student capacity, uh, if, it's, so, if it's indeed but, a function of space. But staff is already doing that work. <clears throat> I mean, you're pretty far down the road on that work, so what's the answer? Is it 1,700 students? Is it 18? With, is it 16? With the, with the additional criteria that right. was presented with here, the it's, additional it's actually criteria. increasing. Um, it's, um, it's, clo it's closer to 1,800 in, in terms of that. And part of what we need to do, what we intend to do, is to go back and reevaluate that. Mm -hmm. um, but it does, uh, in, in a part, the methodology doesn't account for a change in student to teacher ratios. Uh, currently, our model um, accounts for the size of the spaces and the educational facilities. And so, if you triple the number of teachers in a school after it was built, it wouldn't change student capacity. Similarly, if you if you have the number of teachers right. that were in the school, that wouldn't change the capacity. You see the difference? It's mm -hmm. one is a one's a function of teacher FTE, the other is a function of, of space. Right. That's that's the difference, and that's that's the the difficulty in going back and reevaluating this. Thank you. Others? Director Regan? So I had asked early on whether or not um, we could wait on this until board members could get a more full briefing, and I would pose the same question. Um, I'm looking at two community groups who I absolutely respect 
um, both the Bond Accountability Committee, which is experts in the field who are raising way too many questions uh, and good questions. And I'm looking at uh, our Portland, our schools, uh, which is the strongest advocate we could possibly have in support of continuing this bond for the next 30 years, raising questions. So I'm, I'm going to be a no vote if we're going to go forward with this tonight. Uh, there are too many questions out there. I think we need to make sure that, that these groups get their questions answered, and I would like to be part of, of some of those discussions as well. Uh, you asked a question about whether we've looked at other options, boundary changes, schedule changes, whatever it might be. Uh, it's the first I'm hearing that we're building to 1,800. So I'm going to I'm going to so go I, back I, and clarify that one too because the, the number is for 1,700 students and the the um, considerations I'm going to read to you what the because uh -huh. it was programming considerations that and what Jim's referring to in terms of um, number of courses students have access to and number of teachers in the building changes the number of classrooms and also so what we said considerations were students taking an average of 7.6 credits a year. So a, a larger number, so or an average of 30 credits over their high school career rather than the required 24. So if we just assume every student only takes 24 credits and you, and you build it from there, you end up with something different than they have access to more classes than just the required number of credits. Um, assuming teacher, an increased teacher workforce so that we've got, um, as we continue to build back teaching capacity, it, it adds numbers of teachers to the building even though they're serving the same number of students or it's reducing class sizes. And then some of the considerations that have come up in the course of the process um, have been to try and accomplish teachers working in no more than two classrooms, teachers, if they're sharing classrooms, having them be related subjects so that you've got math teachers sharing with math, math teachers, science teachers sharing with science teachers and that that became a more scheduling uh, complexity in terms of what kind of rooms you need then to do it. Um, having appropriate teacher planning periods that are linked, which then is like when you're looking at maximizing use of classrooms, but then having teachers who want to be able to do um, compatible planning periods, it adds more complexity to what the classrooms need to be available. And then there were additional scheduling variables, in, including unique re equipment requirements for various subject areas. So I think part of what's emerged in the dialogue about specific school planning has been just more complexity in the scheduling. So it's not number of kids, it's number of classrooms to serve the number of kids. In fact, Superintendent makes a great point. When I mentioned under our current capacity using, methodology, by revising it, it would be revised such that 1,700 would be the number supported. Still 1,700. And we're using, I'm hearing capacity being used with in different ways, I think, in part of the descriptor. But the 1,700 is still the, the number of kids we're planning for. Does it give you then different flexibility given different schedules over time? Probably. But that's the thinking that's gone into the additional criteria. And the other one I would say, so your next meeting is on the 27th. You've got a, a bond accountability committee be between here and there. The attempt was to try and separate this resolution from the moment you were doing schematic design on Franklin. You could have them be at the same moment and if it doesn't line up that what you decide on this doesn't line up with the schematic design it but just pushes that ahead. If it does line up, they can be compatible in the same meeting. So, I mean, I think you are, in the exact tension of trying to keep, you know, integrity around the decisions being made and keep to the timelines. But, but is that possible? Yes. Well, it, to me, it sort of it seems like we are having the opportunity to ask the questions tonight that the Bond Accountability Committee is asking as well. Yes. Um, so I'd like to just continue the questioning if that's that the, uh, my colleagues all agree that that's how we should move forward and we'll see where we end up on the motion. If we decide um, to wait, there's also, uh, I would entertain a motion to um, postpone for a definite period of time, which would be the next one. But let's go ahead and finish our debate or our discussion now and see where we end up at the end of that. Does that work with everybody? Okay. No. Dr. Yes, Atkins? I'm going to be a no vote. So. That's fine. I, I'm not, I am not voting. Well, we're not, we're not we on can that still right now. We're questions. just having discussion. <laughs> yeah. So, and Ruth has the floor. Can we let her talk? 
Thank so, you. So I just had a, um, I guess, another process question. So maybe I'm just sort of missing something. I think if so, if the schematic design that you're planning to bring forward on the for Franklin on the 27th would reflect this proposed expanded scope right. and the costs and all the other things. So in terms of, I mean, and that's where staff, with the input of um, the architects and engineers and community and teachers and everybody else, has landed as this is the best way you feel we should proceed, even with on balance all the risks that you've outlined and that have been raised. Is that correct? In, in terms of this being uh, an alternative, yes. This is an alternative to, to do that, it, but there's, there's, again, I'm hesitating because there's, um, there's consequences, there's trade-offs. Uh, absolutely. There's, there's risk aspects, both to the program as well as to the project. And so by, <coughs> by constructing these larger, there's more, there's more cost associated with, so there has to be a trade-off somewhere to accommodate the, the extra cost. What we currently have in the schematic design uh, recommendation for Franklin is to construct to the larger size with the additional classrooms, if you will, the additional high school criteria that was outlined in the staff report from last, last Monday evening. So that's, that's what we currently have drawn, what the architect is prepared to present with our uh, project director, and we have the budget delineated for what, what that will cost. So, um I mean, I think what we generally hear from staff after they have worked their, uh, through all the details of the challenges before them is the trade-offs and on balance, we, the recommendation being this is how we should move forward. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm, looking for. that's what I'm looking for. Is this the best, given that there are trade-offs and risks associated with either approach? I mean, that's, and, you know, and then the other piece too is trying to understand if, to me, again, the 1700 is a decision we've already made. The expanded scope is one that sort of has evolved over the last few months. And so to, I'm still not entirely clear on the consequences just in terms even of just moving this project forward. I get that if we were to go back to 1500, that would be a significant yeah. complete upheaval. But so, you're but talking about the, you're talking about the additional criteria that right. just right. So I guess I'm trying to understand a little bit better what the impact. In other words, are the were there um, how far down the path did the team go to where they could pretty quickly get back to that if we were to say we didn't want the expanded scope, or is that really what the team has decided? This is what we need to do, risks and all, and we need to move forward. I'm trying to get a better right. sense of that, and then what the impact would be if we did decide to scale back on the ex, um, expanded scope. Right. Well, the, well, the risks are in scope, in schedule, and budget, and so the budget is the one that usually gets the most attention. And in order to fund the increased scope, we have to reach into uh, future bond projects, uh, the IP projects. And there's uh, a certain amount that's needed for Franklin for that. We also have to uh, lest we not forget the ten million dollars that was identified for staff to bring forward when the schematic design was presented. That allocated amount for Franklin will be identified. And then thirdly, the, uh, the use of escalation dollars, uh, the program component for scope, not just for escalation. So those risk elements manifest across the program, across all the projects that we're doing. And so it, it essentially reduces, um, reduces our contingency base to, to do this work over the eight year timeline. So while we are able to construct Franklin at this increased size, and I think we've indicated with staff concurrence we would do that, we, we can do that. From a constructability standpoint, we can build Franklin to that larger size. But the impacts are, again, on the budget side. Uh, it does stress the, the schedule, although pretty confident we can, we can hit Franklin's schedule. And then the scope, of course, it's a, it's a larger facility. So I guess I'm still not getting so a clear sense of how so, strong, it, yeah. if we did not do what's in this um, resolution, and if we just moved ahead as we have been, right. my question is, what's the so no change in the scope, right? right. No, uh, but and no probable. Is there a change in the budget if we? There, there would still be a change in the budget, but not nearly the degree that's been identified now. So it would be. Uh, considerably less. It wouldn't require uh, use of the IP, the improvement project uh, funds for, for future projects. Um, so we, we could easily go back to that to that size standard, if you will. And uh, what about schedule, Jim? But What's the, the difference the trade -off in the schedule? Is you, don't, you don't have the same flexibility 
again, for the lowering the student-teacher ratio, right. you don't have the same opportunity for the credits. You, you reduce the right. student-driven value component that is really what's driving the recommendation. We're, I mean, right. we're not recommending building the school larger because we want larger schools. We're, we're doing it because you know, the impact right. for, for the students. So that's, that's another trade-off aspect of going back to the smaller size. I, I, I understand all that. I'm just interested in what the difference would be in the budget and the schedule if we did not adopt this resolution. So if, if we don't adopt this resolution, then... Which uh, means we're not making any of those programmatic... Right, so I, we're I not, need to go We're back. not accounting for the programmatic right. changes. I, I don't have the information uh, handy right now. Well, it would... I would go back and I, I can get it very, very quickly. Because okay. I, I know, I anticipated that if we fall back to a smaller scope, what that does budget-wise for Franklin, Roosevelt, and Grant. So uh, how far down the road is the staff in doing the schematic design, would this mean that we would have to pause and allow them more time so that the schedule becomes even more stretched if we decided not to approve this resolution? It's, it's actually easier to go to, to take out scope than it is to add scope in. So mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the design teams, um, we, we would be able to, in my opinion, in the case of Franklin in particular, to go back and adjust it downward. Uh, similarly for Roosevelt, we, we could do the same there okay. uh, in terms of it. So I can Thank produce you. that information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just, just, just to follow up on that, do you have any me? estimate of how, how long it would take to, if you put a pause on the expanded scope piece for the schematic design and went back to the 1700 um, as it was before, how much, what kind of impact, how long it would take before you were ready to come forward with the schematic design, just approximately? So I wouldn't, wouldn't be able to come forward on the 27th, right. next, next Tuesday, but probably the, the next uh, board meeting after that. Uh, okay. The direction okay. to the design team, would, would they would have to redraw their elevations and they would have to <coughs> reshape. Um, there's structural implication, implications because we're adding an additional floor mm -hmm. for some of the classrooms, so they would have to go back and, and do that. I'm confident they could do it within two weeks. And there'd be an additional cost, of course, for that. I mean, again, it's, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm asking, right? right. Yeah. Dr. Buell? 22 million for earthquake retrofitting out. T temporarily, we would use funds that are currently identified for the seismic, the ADA, the roofing. Um, and depending on if other fund sources become available to us, I mentioned the bond premium, then some of that would be offset with with those funds just it's premature uh, to indicate that we would have those funds so we we have accomplished quite a bit already in the way of seismic improvement and, and roofing but it would have an impact ultimately if we weren't able to to refund those well, i would be very interested in what that impact actually would be when you come back if, if we're not able to refund it you mean if, no if we're not able to is our, is school why not going to get an upgrade, and so we kill a few extra kids right. because we don't give them an upgrade or something like that. That's really I wanted not, to not kind of, I wanted to kind of make sure I understand. I'd be happy to provide that. What that I impact is. I have it by school and by work scope. Thank you. That school. would be helpful. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah. uh, student representative so, Davidson. Thank you. So, if one of our considerations is that students take an average of six point seven point six credits, what will we? What was the number we were assuming they were taking before now, if it wasn't 7.6? Has that changed? Mm -hmm. Or is this just to be able to give those 1,700 yeah, students it's, their full? It's less now. I don't actually know what the number is right now. I know there's an average across the district. I think it was actually done on graduation requirements. So okay. what I'm saying 24 was, is graduation requirements, was I think part of the number that was used at the end specs. And in fact, our students take significantly more classes than that in order to get to the 24. So, okay. or some students do, not all students, but a lot of students do. Well, There's and we're in a position where we need to provide that opportunity. So, and, yeah. and we're able and to now. much of our successful strategy in raising our graduation rate is by having significantly more course offerings that students have opportunity to take, so. Right, okay. So, uh, just to give you guys an idea of where I'm at, uh, I feel like we're really setting a precedent here, an unofficial precedent, because not only for staff, but for you know future DAGs as well. Um, and I'm really uncomfortable right now because I feel like we're stuck between a rock and a hard place where we either 
we approve without the bond accountability committee's approval or recommendation, sorry, or we push the project farther off track, and that really makes me uncomfortable. Um, I see some of the concerns that I have been that I, I still feel like there needs to be more specificity, and I feel like if we approve this, we risk not only the future projects of this bond, but future bonds as well. You know, voters will not be pleased if we, if we can't finish some of our projects because we spent too much at the beginning. You know, I'm, I'm really concerned about this. Um, I mean, but I'm also really appreciative of what this tries to do. So I understand that we're, I want to see schools be as equal as possible. I realize there's a learning curve, and we, we should be factoring in that learning curve. But also, I don't want to be able to look at the schools that were built at the beginning of the bond cycle and afterwards and see major differences in the opportunities available to those students. Mm -hmm. So I have those concerns, but I would just like to, you know, say to you all, if we vote no, when, if at all, will we be adding these criteria? Will it be later in this bond, at the next bond, after that? I mean, I think we need to be thinking about that. When these issues come up, when will be it, we be addressing them? So, yeah. So I think, you know, generally we review the long range facilities plan every 10 years and at specs, and my guess is that the last high schools that we do are gonna be very different from the first high schools we do because of the number of years in between. But I yeah. totally appreciate your comments, Andrew, and, and agree that we wanna be as, um, we wanna we want to build the best high schools possible for the students right now. So you're absolutely right about the rock and the hard place. So, other, uh, Director Regan. So Superintendent Smith, you went through the considerations in terms of students taking an average of 7.6 credits and uh, trying to reduce a student-teacher ratio, which I think we all want to do. Those to me are kind of givens, especially since we had the parent complaint and we've kind of worked out where we're going next. My question is on the next page, to the maximum extent feasible. Teachers work in no more than two classrooms. Related subjects share classrooms. Appropriate teacher planning periods are linked. Additional barriers for scheduling, including unique, unique equipment requirements full-time instructors, part-time instructors. So my question on that, on those, is are those nice-to-haves or are those must-haves? They're ones that reflect current practice in buildings, and we actually had um, building staff in both Franklin and Roosevelt work on schedules and, and operationalize the designs um, and look at what's current practice around where you want teachers with common planning periods, where, so, I mean, this is really truly operationalizing. But I guess I'm just looking designs. at if a nice to have is gonna cost us $18 million, mm -hmm. then we need to know what's a nice to have and what's a must have. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm also curious to know whether we have an opportunity during the student work day yeah. to have, um, you know, we had at one point talked about teachers having a staggered schedule where some would come in a little bit earlier and some would stay a little bit later and then all of a sudden you extend, you know, all of a sudden you're using classes more efficiently and I don't know if that's even an option. So, so I don't know if those things have been looked at so that you're not spending money on building, you're just. Yeah. So the, there are a number of other levers that we could be using at this point. So we could be doing things that are staggering schedules. We could be looking, we can't, could be looking at boundaries. So we could go back to the 1500 capacity sure. instead of the 1700 and just know that we're, as we have um, changes that we're assuming that we will be doing boundary changes as part of this, and so assume that. So we could be, yes, we could be doing some of, uh, some other mitigation kinds of strategies. And I think, um, so, yes. So I'm not, just to follow up, I'm not interested in having us go back to 1500. I think the larger the high school, the more opportunities for kids. And I certainly want kids to be able to take as many credits as possible during their high school careers. So I'm just trying to understand what is the flexibility outside of that that wouldn't require us to spend another $18 million on yep. expanding. Even, even with these recommendations, we're still looking at 100% classroom utilization for general education uh, classrooms and science classrooms. So there's a portion of the educational spaces that already will be challenging us as a district in terms of the teaching uh, pedagogy. So as, as we went through, uh, and I'm glad the mention was made that we did work with the building level leadership to, to really drill into the schedules and to see how they would operationalize the, the teaching in these, in these spaces. 
so the feedback that we received is this would be more palatable than what we yeah, had been looking at previously. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. hopefully that came mm -hmm. across, that's but that, that's an important component yeah. to this. Well, Dr. Atkins, following up, but I mean, but the even additional cost would have been one classroom per teacher, which we know we, we just said we could not, no, we could not do that. Really so that, that really would be nice to have, um, and that's, that's not possible. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think the work that was done, that again, I mean, we, we have received, we had said, okay, you know, it's just, it's when you get down to it, for me, it's, it's hearing our bound accountability committee saying they're, um, they're concerned they don't know that they don't have the information. That's, that's what's really escalating this for me. But we did hear all along the way the work that the principals did to really um, figure out how to, make this, how to make this work and what would make sense on the ground. And again, it is part of that learning curve. I think it's totally fair to say, as Scott pointed out, you know, there's, there's a learning curve involved in this. And um, we're, we're finding out more as we go along. I guess the other concern for me just is, is I, I, maybe I'm misinterpreting, but it feels like I'm, I'm hearing an ambivalence from staff around this recommendation. Um, given the, the risks that come with it. And again, usually I feel like there's a trade-off. We understand the, the pros and the cons, but on balance, this is what we think should happen. And I'm not quite hearing that. I'm hearing kind of like we can do it if you say we should, and I'm not. Can I jump in to answer what I think that is? Um, I think staff is trying to deliver what we've asked them to deliver, and so they understand there are risks. But whether or not they say this is the best solution, that's really us. Or whether or not we decide we want to go, as Bobby said, is that a nice to have or is that a want to have? They're not taking an opinion. They're, they're working with the design advisory groups. They're trying to deliver what they're asking for. And it's they're asking us. They're saying, best, this concerns us. We're, we're going over budget or we're going over scope. We're increasing scope. Schedule. We're going over schedule. But they're being very careful, I feel like, not to put themselves as the decision makers because they're not. They're delivering a building that, or buildings and a program that we're asking them to do. As you've pointed out, these are decisions that we've asked them to go rework. We've listened to community members. We've said, well, can you go find a little bit more space here? Can we do this? We need to figure out how many classes. Have you really worked with teachers? And so I, I, that's how I'm making sense of the ambivalence. It's not that they're really ambivalent. It's we keep coming back and forth and they're trying to deliver something that meets what we're asking. And there are risks either way. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think part of our discussion has really been more similar to um, mm -hmm. Director Davidson um, in terms of looking at here are the things, like you start with a long range facility, It's you start with very broad conversations and visionary conversations and really general, and as you get more specific, mm -hmm. different things emerge that are being considerations. We now have more things that are informing, okay, do these, and I mean, it is, when you're saying it's backwards, it is backwards, but it's also iterative. So you mm -hmm. end up with a very you know, broad vision that now is being informed by very specific conversations that we wanna go back and inform the broad vision with. And it could be that we learn these lessons and we apply them going forward and move, just keep moving right now. So mm -hmm. our sense making was we wanna be able to benefit these high schools from what we've been learning. Um, and the group that has been doing the work, and here are the trade-offs, and they're tough trade-offs. So it's not a no-brainer that you make the trade-offs, but that has been our call of these high schools are the home, the cornerstone of the work that we're doing, and wanting to see that, see them benefit. Yeah, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate your your point is really well taken, um, Director Lyle as well. I think it's for me not. I'm feeling like I. There hasn't been as much information about the educational side of this in terms of what it would mean on the on the ground. What exactly do we mean by the um, you know the increased scope? How the classrooms would be used? And I think there was some discussion about that, and we asked if there could be additional information, you know, sort of from the principals and the teachers about how that would work. So I think that's that may be part of it. I mean, I th absolutely, it's our accountability and our, our role to do this. But I think that's part of where my you know. I'm hearing, I'm hearing the information, but I'm, I'm still not seeing, haven't, I don't feel as if I've had as much in depth from the educational side as it would make me more comfortable with this. Okay. Other comments? Dr. Kerwin? I, I want to make a motion, motion to table until next week. Mm -hmm. So I, I move to table this until next that week. That would be to postpone definitely. There's mm -hmm. no such thing as a motion to table. I know that's hard to believe, but. Hmm? To postpone definitely so is what you would like, right? To postpone definitely. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. 
it, uh, just to be clear, mm -hmm. so maybe the intent is we'll, we'll deal with this, we will week, have right. a vote next week on this yes. issue, yeah. and that's the language that gets that done. That's the language that gets it there. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, just following those Robert's rules. Thank you. Um, so um, we can have limited debate on that motion. It's been moved and seconded that we postpone it. definitely. Uh, is there? I just want to make sure that we're clear on what we need so that we can make a decision next week. Yes. <laughs> because I'm not clear what, well, I, what's I'll, going to be different next week other than the bond exactly. accountability. We'll come back and say, now we have answers and we still have the same concerns. <laughs> well, that would be good to know. That, could be, that yeah. could be what happens, but then what do we do? <laughs> what information are we needing so that we can make a decision? Or is it the educational piece? Like, like I'm looking for specific things that you're looking for. That well, for, for, for me, it's, it's a... Um, uh, emerging of, of process and schedule uh, so uh, having the bond accountability committee uh, fully briefed um, is what I need mm -hmm. okay. and they're not fully briefed now uh, and I'll be ready to make a decision uh, when that is done and I just want to highlight for our sake that if the bond accountability committee comes back next week and is fully briefed and we all decide that um, we in fact want to go back to the 1700 original scope not original scope because that was 1500 but 1700 original size um, that we understand that that will um, that will delay our schedule by at least 14 days if not at least 21 days which will put us then at 110 days delayed which is where roosevelt is i just want to make I'm sure that we all understand, understand. you're presupposing yep. what a vote might be I'm just so, no, I, yeah. right. I'm just saying that yeah. the, there are two choices. We say yes or we say no, and <coughs> it has a consequence on budget. And I'm I'm not mm -hmm. denying or saying that's a bad choice. I'm just mm -hmm. want to make sure that we're aware. Other comments? So to me, I think we have all of the information in front of us. I think we all have gone through this a couple of times. We know what. The staff is asking for with regard to um, the increase in the programmatic pieces and we know why and we know how much it's going to cost to do that. Um, I'm not opposed to having the bond accountability come in and the committee come in and tell us what they think about those expenses and that schedule and that scope. Um, but in the end, we're back to Student Representative Davidson's comment that we're in between a rock and a hard place because mm -hmm. it's always going to be a difference in the scope and the budget and um, and so I'm fine with uh, tabling this uh, or <laughs> or or uh, postponing it definitely definitely um, but I I don't think it's going to make a difference in how we're going to be able to make a decision. I think we have everything we need right now to make that. So, Dr. Regan? I would definitely like to understand what projects are going to be taken off the table if we go forward with this, because I do not feel like I have that information. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's very important to me that our buildings be seismically sound and we have good roofs on them and the rest, and Absolutely. I do not understand mm -hmm. what this vote would mean mm -hmm. in terms of that so yeah. I would like that information I, I have those details. that's great mm -hmm. I agree. but I also want to again highlight the fact that staff can't give us that definitively because let's say that we issue the next bond I know but they can give us a okay yes. right give okay. I just want to make sure that we right that it's clear we could end up doing all the projects we just right. don't know or of even course. fewer if I, right. I mean really what's yep. happening is cost is increasing um, our economy is improving, which means we could get a lower bond premium. Like it, we could actually wind up. Right. We we just don't know at this right. point, but that right. would certainly mitigate some of it. But what I'll share with you is what we know now, in terms of moving the dollars, uh, postponing the projects, and which projects, which schools specifically, and what the work scopes are. Each of those schools, so you'll have, you'll have complete visibility. Director Atkins. And I do feel like I mean again, it's it's. You have provided us with that information. I mean, we have been briefed about this. Um, I think it's just continually facing up to these trade-offs and the difficulty of it. So I guess, you know, That's right. I'm, I'm obviously wrestling with this and um, experiencing the, the heartburn, but I, I feel like we do, what's, 
And hearing um, staff and, and superintendent and my colleagues, I mean, I think we, we have to just, we need to move this forward based on the direction that we've given and the information that staff has, has come to us. So if we don't have enough support to be able to move forward with having the schematic design for Franklin come next week, um, so be it. But I guess I'm kind of come full circle it's, after having heard um, Mr. Spellman earlier kind of um, threw me back a little bit, but I'm, I've come full circle to where I was before when I came into this meeting, which was reluctantly and with a lot of concerns and worries and full um, agitation about the risks, feeling like on balance this is what we needed to do to move forward to build the high schools um, right, given the information that we have now. So that's where I am finally at, the, at 923. <laughs> We're only 20 minutes behind, believe it or not. Okay, any other discussion on the motion? All right, there's a motion to postpone definitely, the motion to, well, the <laughs> motion on the, very, the resolution, where we have 4917, that's good enough, for the additional criteria for high school educational specifications. Um, all those in favor of the motion? Yes. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. 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 Ruth, are you a yes or a no? I was a no, I just said no. no. Okay. Well, we're right stuck in the middle then. We need four. Yeah. And student representative Davidson, you can't give us that fourth vote. <laughs> so the motion fails for uh for postpone. For postpone. And so now we vote on it. So yeah. So it's gonna go down anyway. Well, and that's, a, that's a very good point. So uh, I don't know if this, this probably doesn't make no sense whatsoever, but I mean, I think if, I guess part of this is that the, the resolution is very, is around just, is the piece of the overall modification of the scope and going back to the long range facilities plan and so, and so forth. Um, so is it that we absolutely have to make that decision and set that in motion, even though we've already given approval to the schematic design and the, and the scope and so forth? So that ha that piece has to come first without without you moving forward with Franklin and coming forward with the schematic design based on our direction. It's actually embedded in the in the staff report for upon board concurrence for the scope. The resolution itself is actually separate from that. It uh, directs staff to go back and reevaluate the student capacity methodology and evaluate the comprehensive high school ed spec. So it, it's a it's difficult to one to respond to. It's um, well, I, I, I mean, just listening to my colleagues, my guess is that this motion is going to fail as well, and we will be back next week, mm -hmm. I'm sure, with you to answer the same questions that we have. So why don't we, if unless I hear objection, why don't we go ahead and vote and on the motion, and and I'm sure you'll be back. Can, Jeff. I, can, I, can I make Gregory. a suggestion? Sure. Yeah. Could we potentially revote on the motion to table? If we know it's gonna fail and we don't want it to fail, yeah. because we wanna have more discussion, it would be better for folks to just vote to table it for a well, week and then take a vote. So I, that's what, what you I need to recommend. do for that is to move to move. reconsider. <laughs> so I'm gonna move, move to, it. I'm going to move. All you have to do I'm is move to, move to postpone to indefinitely again, you know? Oh, do I just do that or move to reconsider? You can't do it. Can do. You can't do it because you voted. Oh, I yeah, can't do it. It has to be one of the three people so voted. No, I'd like to move to <laughs> there you go. Um, postpone definitely. Motion or excuse me, resolution four nine one seven. I'll second. I don't know if you okay. can second. So we no. have uh, one of you two. I'll second it. Let's okay, on. so all those in favor? Yes. 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 Yes, yes although I'm still and I'm entirely clear on where this still leaves us in the end. Okay. Uh, all those opposed? It's uh, the motion passes with a vote of six to zero with student representative Davidson voting. Yes. Yes. Okay. No, I get that. Mr. Owens, is there anything else you need from us tonight? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for um, answering as many of those questions as you could. We really appreciate uh, you doing that time. And we're going to take a two minute break. Great. And we're going to get.
Okay. Whoop, back on. Thank you. Okay, now we'll move to our next um, agenda item, which I'm sure will move very quickly. Uh, the approval of the 2014-2015 budget. Um, I'll ask for a, uh, first. I'll ask for a motion to recess the board from its regular meeting and reconvene as the budget committee. Do I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Uh, Director Regan moves, and uh, Director Curler seconds a motion to recess the board into uh, the budget committee. All those in favor, please say yes. Yes. Any opposed? No. Okay. We will now recess the board from its regular meeting and convene as a budget committee. The board as a budget committee has held several study sessions on budget topics and two public hearings. The board will now consider the superintendent's proposed 2014-2015 budget. Superintendent Smith, would you like to make any comments about the budget? Um, actually, no, at this time I'm really, oh, it's over to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, We'll now consider resolution 4918, budget committee approval of the 2000 F fiscal year, 2014-15 budget and imposition of property taxes. Ms. Houston, is there any citizen comment? There is not. Okay. Is there board discussion on this resolution? We need a motion to Well, that's down here. For this, it's, it'll be down here. No, nope, it's in the wrong place. Yeah. Okay. This is really odd. Excuse me, just a second. This is different. Okay. All right. Is there any citizen comment? I've got that. No. Yeah, I have a motion and a second. You need that. Okay. So, do I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Okay. Director Belisle moves, and Director Adkins seconds. <coughs> a motion to adopt resolution four nine one eight. Not. So is there board? So I did citizen comment. Is there any uh, board discussion on the resolution? Yes. Director Buell. I'm going to read a statement. Sure. I'm not going to be able to vote for the budget, not because it isn't a halfway decent budget. After all, we have added a fairly large number of teachers, and I have great trust in Neil Sullivan. He and David Wynn and Sarah Bottomley answered every question I had about the budget and spent adequate time with me going through the entire budget document. I appreciated their attitude and their help immensely. But the problem is twofold. First, we, the school board, have not fulfilled once again our obligation to the community to act responsibly according to policy which states, the board publicly deliberates and adopts an annual budget in compliance with budget laws and statutes to ensure the legal expenditure of funds. We have been working with the superintendent since September on the budget, setting priorities, organizing the work in our employees, and identifying themes of the budget which we might want to include. The superintendent's recommended budget for close to a half billion dollars was finalized and published on March 31st. That is the budget. Before its finalization, it is all guesswork. A board member can't truly and fully respond until he or she can actually see the results. Then there is a tight timetable for community input and board deliberations. This is where we botched it. We didn't produce a parallel, understandable budget which would have allowed the community to give an adequate response. And our public hearings were a joke. Board members weren't even allowed to ask clarifying questions of people who testified, the few that did. But what would they have testified about since the state designated form of the budget document is pretty much incomprehensible to the average citizen? We have a budget review committee, but we officially received their budget message last Monday. And I guarantee no one is going to be willing to make changes this evening based on their message. So in effect, their fine work might as well not have been done. But worst of all, since March 31st, we scheduled one hour of budget deliberations, part of which was taken up by another presentation and all of which was run under time duress. In fact, Director Adkins even commented that she felt that it was too late for actual deliberations. One hour to deliberate the actual budget, and it is too late during that hour to publicly deliberate. So in essence, the school board is elected to oversee the almost half billion dollars of taxes which people in Portland have paid to run the schools. And this is not a pittance. 
Many, many people pay property taxes in the thousands of dollars and pay income taxes, often much higher than their property taxes. They then elect people to make sure this money is well spent on practically the most important action a community can take, that of educating their children. And how did we handle our responsibility? We scheduled less than eight seconds in public discussion for every million dollars of tax money we spent. Once again, we shortchanged the electorate and our own district's children. The second problem I have is that we didn't discuss and deliberate some of the most important budget decisions we have. Here are some of them. We still have around $14 million in outside contracts dealing just with education matters. We have another $12 million or so dealing with additional tech people, over and above the 45 we have as regular employees. $14 million would pay for around 150 more teachers in our schools. We needed to discuss this. I made a motion to spend a million dollars of this money on social service coordinators in each of our high schools. It didn't even get a second. Yet we have around a thousand kids who are homeless and lots of children in poverty. We need people who can help children bridge their secular world with their school world. People used to call these children throwaway kids. Not very PC today, but we needed to discuss our wraparound programs and how the budget approached them. We we struggle with kids not reading, yet we can't find money to hire librarians in our elementary schools. Maybe we should have spent some of the money we found in October on librarians instead of educational assistant. We didn't discuss this. The middle grades in Portland Public Schools continue to languish in many of our schools plagued by a lack of engaging electives and activities, as well as undermanned in the area of reading. Where are the discussions that connect this to the budget? We are increasing the amount of testing we are asking of our schools, not even counting the coming SBAC disaster. Many pe people believe this is an educational error. We needed to discuss how the budget addresses this and where we could better spend the money. We are spending millions on our equity programs, but some people believe it focuses too heavily on the adults in our system instead of more directly benefiting our students. We needed to discuss this and see if this was correct and make important adjustments if needed. The English as a second language instruction is on a very wobbly foundation. We needed to discuss the, the role and expansion of the newcomers program and how we might, within the budget, better address the needs of children in the program and the needs of our teachers instructing these students. I am not an expert in special ed, but many people have described much of what we do as a district as a mess. How did we address this in the budget? And we had an obligation to look seriously at concerns citizens have brought forward in the past month concerning budget matters such as at Riggler, Da Vinci, Llewellyn, Chapman, and Lincoln High School. I could go on and on, but I think you all get the point. We didn't fulfill our obligations or our responsibilities. Budget by back room instead of budget by public deliberation. I can't support it. I'm now going to make an amendment. I move we amend the budget to fund the $40,000 for the early development of a health clinic at Benson High School if the grant Benson has applied for does not materialize. The source of this money will be left to the discretion of the superintendent. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Director Buell. This isn't really a large amount of money and it's a huge problem and I think that $40,000 out of our $505 million budget, we can figure out where to get this. We generally have this, that type of money around. It's, you know, I'm not, I didn't purposely bring forward any other motions, which I had 25 or 30, but this one just seems like we could actually do this. And then those people can go ahead and start planning for a health clinic if they, if they have that money assured to them. The director, I was just curious. Director uh, or student representative Davidson. Thank you. I was just uh -huh. curious. Is this one of the Multnomah County health yeah. clinics that the, we have? What the, this is the this is the one we don't have at Benson. Right. So would we exist. be partnering with Multnomah County for this one? E or eventually, this yeah. That's the de development money at Benson is to set that to begin to set that up and make the plans for a health clinic at Benson. Okay. They, they've they've applied for a grant. If they get the grant, they're they would go forward with that. If they don't get the grant, they can still go forward with that. With that. I just think we should support that. A lot of kids out there and they should. Other, sure use other discussion? 
Director for, Regan? I guess my general sense is as of tomorrow, we will know who our new county commissioner chair is going to be. Uh, we'll, and um, I mean, this strikes me as an amazing partnership opportunity. Um, I guess I'm not sure that this is an area that I, I mean, I, I'm, Steve, I'm totally supportive of trying to figure out early warning systems and having social workers and, and the rest to help us at our high schools and with our own populations. In terms of actually doing a health clinic, I think it's beyond the scope of what a K-12 school system can or, can or should be doing. I think it's a partner, it's a perfect opportunity to partner with the county whose job it is to do that. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate the sentiment. I'm not sure I can, I, I would say that I want us to get into actually operating mental health clinics in our schools. So. This sets up the development for the uh, county to go for, yeah. Yeah, and, and again, I think forward. we can, it's not a lot of money. I think that's something that we could, I, I would much rather have something where we direct the superintendent to talk with the county and kind of see what the opportunities are rather than committing budget dollars to it at this time. I, I, I guess I want to see what the opportunities are. Director Atkins? Yeah, and I mean, I think again, I totally support the spirit behind this, but I think in terms of process and responsible uh, budgeting and governance, um, to bring forward sort of very micro additions um, at this stage in the process um, is not responsible because there's any number of similar suggestions that any all of us could be making at this point and all of them have implications and all of them need to be considered in the full context of um, the staff's charge from us to come up with a budget that meets the needs of our kids and we've got um, so well, that's it I'm just not going to support additional um, you know micro targeted suggestions at this point to the superintendent. Director Regan? I guess my I would disagree that this is exactly I would, I would disagree this is exactly the time that we're supposed to be looking at that and in fact I'll be bringing forward an amendment in a second uh, I don't know when else we would bring it forward this is our this is our time I just think that this one is uh, a little bit outside of the scope of what we're supposed to be doing as as a k-12 school system but it's absolutely something I would love to see us partner with the county on. any other comments okay all those in favor of the amendment please say yes 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 all those opposed say no no, no. no. The amendment fails any other comment uh, Comments on the budget, Director Regan. Yeah. Um, so if I if if I follow Steve's lead, I think I want to make some comments <laughs> on the budget, and then I have an amendment that I wanted to offer. Okay. If that's how you'd like to do it. That's so fine. first of all, um, Carol, I think you actually did an amazing job listening to um, staff and board members and um, the community um, in all of the various listening sessions, and I think we all um, need to be incredibly grateful to our legislators um, for allocating more money to K-12 finally and start uh, increasing the share of the pie that goes to take K-12 and to thank our voters as well for supporting us with a local option that provides just tens of millions of dollars every year for us to pay for teaching positions. So um, as I look at the budget in general, the things that I'm just so excited about after 11 years on the board and um, kind of seeing where we're, we are doing ads, um, and just a couple of them I just wrote down as I was sitting here. The fact that we're expanding language immersion programs, the fact that you're talking about having new CTE career coordinators in our high schools is something we've talked about for a long time. I am personally thrilled that you uh, are going to ensure that we have counseling support in every single Portland public school. A parent knows when they send their kid to a Portland public school that there will be some level of counseling support there, so I'm really thrilled with that. Um, adding a couple, I, and I think you kind of heard me on that one, I think you are adding a couple of groundskeepers so that we can be proud, more proud of how our buildings and facilities look, and that was one that certainly Steve, I think, can feel good about. Um, the expansion of early ed, the fact that we're adding more days, um, more teachers, 70 K-8 teachers, 50 high school teachers, 30 special ed teachers, and more. Um, the fact that we're lowering our student-teacher ratio, I mean, I don't know that I knew that that would happen when I was on the board. I mean, it's always something you dream about and you, you don't know whether we'll actually get there. It's just so exciting, I can't stand it. The fact that we're lowering the high school student-teacher, student-counselor ratio, 
that's something that we set out to do five years ago and it was something we haven't gotten to. I think the high school system design plan said the council ratio would be one to 300. It's now one to 400. You were setting it at one to 350. I mean, that's huge progress. Um, and I'm hoping that in the next year or two, we actually hit that target. So um, just amazing. Um, the fact that you're putting some work into restorative justice. I mean, there's just so many, there's so many ways that this budget is a, a great, great budget for our kids and for our staff. Um, so I'm really excited. I appreciate CBRC, the, uh, um, the Budget Review Committee, Citizen Budget Review Committee, and the comments that they had. Um, I agree that we haven't had nearly enough opportunity for the public to weigh in on it, just so you know. So there were two things that I um, specifically had concerns about in the budget. One is that I had hoped that we would do more of an investment in our early warning systems, maybe a care team type approach like Hillsborough, which was the social worker idea. Um, I had been told by staff afterwards um, that we actually are doing more than what is visible in the budget. Um, and I'm, so I'm satisfied with that at this point in time. It's something I will continue to ask about. Um, but the uh, area of school-wide supports is the area where I do want to offer an amendment. Um, so I'd like to read the amendment first, and then maybe I could talk about it. And hopefully first, somebody first will second. second. But then you can talk about it after that. Exactly. So the budget amendment would be, uh, the Board of Education for Pu Portland Public Schools requests a budget adjustment to the superintendent's 2014 proposed budget to include 4.5 FTE to be added to the high school school-wide support table as follows. 0.5 FTE to each large community comprehensive with 1,000 or more students. Those would include Cleveland, Franklin, Grant, Lincoln, Madison, and Wilson. Plus an additional 0.5 FTE to Madison and an additional 1 FTE to Franklin, acknowledging their need to support significant populations of high poverty and historically underserved students. So that would be my amendment, would be to add 4.5 FTE to the high school, school-wide support table. So that's, I would move that. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Discussion? And discussion. So a few months ago, this superintendent and this school board settled a contract with our teachers union in which we made a strong and public statement about workload. We acknowledge that workload matters. We put in writing that most high school teachers will not have a workload that exceeds 180 students. We've also acknowledged in this budget that workload matters when it comes to our high school counselors. This budget includes significant funding to hire more counselors, bringing our student to counselor ratio from 401 to 350 and one. We hope to get to 300 to one or better in future budgets. And in our recently passed contract with our teachers, we established a workload committee that will make recommendations to address specific workload concerns from teachers next year. We set aside a million dollars to fund needed adjustment based on recommendations from this group. So pretty strong statements about workload. Tonight, I'm asking this superintendent and this board to acknowledge that workload matters for other employee groups too, including our principals, vice principals, librarians, and classified staff, including campus monitors, career coordinators, study hall monitors, bookkeepers, IT support staff, et cetera. Superintendent Smith's budget indicates that school-wide staffing is a combination of four factors, including school-wide support. Today, we have some huge disparities in school-wide support at the high school level, and these disparities impact our classified staff, and we actually heard from Belinda today on this, and our students in significant and unacceptable ways. A career coordinator at one high school has a workload supporting 250 students, yet across town, a career coordinator is expected to support nearly 750 students. That's three times more. At our larger high schools, this workload is a setup for failure or at a minimum mediocrity. Similarly, while a campus monitor in one school has a workload of about 250 students across town, another campus monitor has a workload that covers 750. This is the case even in one large high school, our only high school, that does not have a designated school resource officer or school police presence on campus. At one high school, the study hall monitor supports a student population of 500 plus students, while at another, the study hall monitor is expected to support 1,500. Likewise, our technology staff supports a need of 500 or so students at one school and 1,500 students at another. Anyone looking at our school-based staffing table can recognize that the workload issue 
it is unacceptable. The students in schools where this disparity is most striking include our community comprehensive high schools with over a thousand students, Cleveland, Franklin, Grant, Lincoln, Madison, and Wilson. I don't expect that we have the capacity to fix these disparities tonight in the budget, but we can acknowledge the disparity by taking some token action and putting <coughs> some preliminary budget dollars behind it. Tonight I'm offering a friendly amendment because I do think this is an awesome budget. I'm offering a friendly amendment, amendment that adds one half of a full-time equivalent position or, or FTE as we say to the discretionary support line of our administrative school support table for all high schools with a thousand students or more. A .5 FTE equates to one full-time classified position. While that doesn't come close to making things as we'd like, it is a start. Going farther, I'd like us to acknowledge that two of our community comprehensive high schools, Madison and Franklin, Franklin serve a large number of high poverty and historically underserved students. As such, I propose adding another .5 FTE at Madison and another full FTE at Franklin. In total, I'm only asking us to add 4.5 classified FTE to better support our large community comprehensives and the students they serve. And we can keep in mind that that compares to the fact that we added 68 classified staff positions in our elementary schools this year. Recognizing that it is already late in our staffing process, and Ruth, you've acknowledged that several times, I suggest that we simply add these few FTE to the discretionary line of our high school su school-wide support tables, allowing principals to fill in where the need is greatest. I am most excited that this ad will allow our high school principals and vice principals to manage their buildings in a more safe and appropriate way while allowing them more time to be the instructional leaders, coaches, and mentors that we expect them to be. This investment would cost $371,000 for next year, which is a minuscule adjustment when looking at an overall budget of more than $500 million. The funding to support this amendment could come from reserves while still allowing a robust operating contingency, or I'm open to the superintendent making a suggestion of a small tightening somewhere else that won't impact current supports to students or schools. I hope and expect that we would attempt to maintain these staff positions going forward and make additional administrative adjustments supporting K-12 students, at schools and students in our budget as our budget situation allows. When our superintendent put forth this budget, she attempted to incorporate feedback from board member staff and community members, and I really do believe you did a good job. The amendment I'm offering aligns fully to the priority she and we have identified in this budget, so I ask for your support. Other comments? <coughs> Director Buell? Bobby, was that, uh, is that on, they're sitting last meeting when we talked about uh -huh. we had that discretionary stuff at the bottom. So there right 16 now. 16 discretionary FT at the bottom. Right now, if you're a small school, you like 500, you get a point seven. If you have 1,000 students, you get uh, 1.4. And if you are uh, over 1,500, you would get 2.1, I believe, is the numbers. Uh, that's the so right across the, the bottom. Uh -huh. So this is on top of that discretionary? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I'm not looking to take away from anybody on this. I think we're, no, we're I mean, way, 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 way. It's on top of the discretionary yeah. at the bottom. It would just add and, it and, so that there's a little and, bit. And while I have the floor, I'm going to ask the superintendent. <coughs> the woman who spoke earlier tonight about the educational assistance said that some of those, how many educational assistants, wasn't that 68? So no, last no, year no, we added class, 68 classified staff. 68 they classified were determined staff. by each school how they used them. Where they were going to so use them. So they weren't, yeah. And, and I thought those were pretty, that were, those were back in the budget. They were. She, she had talked about that those are disappearing. She, and you know what? Is Sean up back there? That's so what you can see where I was confused. I, I totally did. And it has I to totally do with whether, did. how I'm going to get Sean to come up and give you specifics on this one because it's not the same. It's not the same. Yeah, not the same 68, and he can give me more specifics of. So, Sean, we're 68 FT, we're not talking 68. We're talking leave. 68 real people, but. So, I'm going to let Sean just okay. give detail on what this Sean actually knows what is. He's so, doing Sean Murray, who's our chief of human resources officer. Thank you, Good Sean. Good evening, board members. Sean Murray, Chief of Human Resources Officer. 
And did you hear the question that was being asked about the, um, Belinda's comments earlier about the um, unassigned classified staff? Yes, so essentially um, we don't know how many will be, as a result, will be laid off. Uh, essentially there are 70 unassigned PFSP members. Uh, EAs comprise most of the list. The reason are the results for the layoffs, if any, uh, is due to Title I funds, also foundation money uh, being uh, taking, taken away, and also student enrollment going down. So that student enrollment changes? Yes. So the, so the 68 FTE we added, would those be the first taken away because they're the, they have the least seniority? And we well, would move some people from other places into where those 68 people now are? Let's say uh, we have one as, you understand my question. Well, as it stands right now, we have 70 unassigned. And so essentially we'll be meeting next week, hopefully, to review the unassigned positions and determine if we can place them elsewhere within uh, other vacant positions. Well, are all those, all 68 unassigned or those 68 people we put on in, in October? Uh, I'm not I mean, sure. 70, if you got 68 we put on and they're the least priority, they would be the least Senior. tenure. First. And then, so, and it we had 70 of them, I would think you'd have wiped out all 68 of those people. It depends on the positions. I mean, essentially, there are 70, most of them are EA positions, which we did add. So essentially, we wiped out those 68 people. Basically, not necessarily. Not exactly perfectly, but pretty darn close. Well, we still have until next week to look at the positions that are available and then determine where we can place those unassigned folks. So essentially, we're not looking at layoffs yet until we're, actually, until we're actually able to see what positions we have available to place those positions well, the, into. But within the budget, so you got the budget positions, and then you got this, this group of 70 teachers over here. And then we budgeted for a certain number, and some of those are going to still be blank, and we're gonna take some of the 70 and put them over there. And we don't know how many that's gonna be. We don't know yet until we review. Well, do we have any estimates about what that's going to be? I mean, I mean, essentially, we're early in terms of the hiring process, and so essentially next week we're going to be taking a look at the unassigned positions and determine what vacancies we have available that we can place those positions into or those employees into. Sean, what does it mean when you said Title One? A lot of these are, are many of these e EAs Title One. Uh, from my understanding, uh, Title I funds have gone away in uh, certain areas, and so also foundation money as well. And then also uh, student enrollment has gone down in, within specific schools, which has resulted in uh, assignments. I understand student enrollment, but I'm curious about um, foundation funding in Title I, especially since we used funds I, I, I'm recalling we use just state funds to hire all those people. So why all of a sudden are they in different budget areas? I think they're so not necessarily the same people. Yes, not, you would say add that we did in the, this year's budget right. was um, general fund. Was a general fund to add? Right. It was not specifically just EAs. People could have added secretarial support right. in their schools, but they were classified staff, and you were, it was up to the school to determine what kind of. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about, what Sean's talking about now, is again across a different band of funding, um, funding streams. It's now impacted. Yeah, but and it's the same people. No, it's not necessarily, that necessarily the same people. No, but I mean, it's the same, same group of it's the same group of employees Do they come who are under being the same impacted. Do your rules and stuff that we have for the layoff stuff? Can we lay off anybody we want? In well, and the, and we're talking unassigned, EA? not laid off. So, like that's the other distinction being made right now is the unassigned, like a position may have gone away. The, I understand the teaching yeah. stuff, but the, the is there a bumping process? Yes. Yeah. There is a bumping process. But there's multiple categories of employees. Right. But we're looking at where the unassignments occur, and then we're also looking at where new vacancies have occurred as well. And so we will be looking at placing those employees so who have been of those assigned into in, in, Oh, I'm sorry. Some of those people will be placed. Some of Bobby's people here would be placed into those positions? 
So sure. Bob, if she's Bobby's got amendment, seven yes. FTE, potentially we yes. Have yet four and a half FTE, Bobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's nine, nine, people. nine people. So we would have that would take care of nine of those people we were laying off potentially. Potentially, yeah. Right. Yes, potentially. Okay. Depends on whether right. they have Thank to be licensed staff or not. Yeah, I mean they'd have it to be licensed on for the, the job. Staff or not. Well, the, one, the position she would have would the, the screw up would only be if you need somebody maybe who does secretarial work and you end up with an EA who doesn't do secretarial work and her stuff might be too, so you might have some of those campus conflicts, monitor. but in, yeah, campus monitor. monitor, but in general, that might happen. It could happen. It could happen. So the, yeah. the category that Bobby, that um, Director Egan is proposing is discretionary support, which covers a wide variety of yeah, potential right. places yeah. you could apply it, some of which are classified and some of which are licensed. So it, it would depend on, again, on each individual school and how the they applied it. Would. Exactly. Okay. You got it. Thank you. But like bookkeeper, could potentially be one of the classified staff if it was, a, or secretary could potentially be one of those people. Yes. Other comments, board members. Director Crowder. Uh, yes, just I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna vote yes, and I appreciate Bobby your leadership on this. I think it's uh, it's um, makes a rationale. It, it's a more rational approach um, in terms of, of the uh, uh, populations in the in the high schools. So I'm a yes vote. <laughs> Other comments? I also will be voting yes. Dr. Um, I'm going to be a no vote, but not because I don't um, agree that this uh, is an important thing. Um, what I hear is Superintendent Smith saying this is the next step that we take when we look at reinvestment. I'm hopeful, actually, that our tax revenue will continue to increase and that we'll actually be here in the fall. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to some high schoolers on uh, last week, um, and it was just really, really clear actually how much this kind of support um, would mean. Um, so I, I don't want my unwillingness to support this tonight to seem like I don't understand that, um, and I appreciate you bringing it forward. Um, but I guess part of what has me has the tension in me for voting now is that I have the conversations of the people that wanted more restorative justice. Mm -hmm. um, I have the folks from Scott who said we need additional support. I have the folks from Wrigler in my head who say we're losing some really valuable people. Folks from Llewellyn who say we cannot have a second grade with our first graders who have been 31 in their classrooms. The folks from Chavez who were clear about what they needed. Um, I, Director Buell wants librarians in every, every elementary school. Every I, think that's, I, I think that's really, really valuable. We heard from folks in Maplewood. We hear from folks in high schools about various needs. Um, talented and gifted hasn't even come up, but I know that we, I don't think that we're serving them as well as we could. Um, I think of adaptive PE, which we've cut over the years. I think of qualified mental health professionals, which you, again, we've added some of those in this budget, um, but it's not to the level that we need. So again, it's this place where, thank goodness we're in a reinvestment budget in Superintendent Smith. I think you've done a great job of being responsive to our conversations. Um, as far as I can tell, the, the most behind door conversations about budget has been with director with um, our ch deputy chief financial officer and director Buell talking about budgets, because mm -hmm. the rest of the conversations I've heard here and that the budget really did reflect what our conversations were. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, knowing that while we're in a reinvestment, which is thankful for the legislature, we're not to the place where we can do all of these things that we know that our students need. And again, Having just met with high school students, it's very real that we are losing students um, because we cannot fund the supports that they need um, or not serving them as well as, as we need to be. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate the amendment, um, but I, I won't be voting yes. Other comments? I agree with everything Director Belial just said. Um, same reason I really appreciate, you know, in the um, in your March 31st um, kind of eight-page detailed budget message, Superintendent Smith, where you where you lay out where you are, the priorities, and what you have heard from us and from the community, and where you landed um, with, in, in your recommendation, as well as the uh, citizen budget, budget, citizens budget review committee's um, support and um, their response to your budget as well. So. Again, exactly, the, the needs continue at every level in our district and we're not funding everything that, that the need is out there. I appreciate um, the spirit of what Bobby brought forth, but um, I'm in a vote as well. Anybody else? Okay, 
So I'm also going to be a no vote on this for all of the reasons that uh, I think Greg covered everything and given the time and whatnot, I'm not going to go into those in detail, but I also am thankful that Bobby brought this forward and continues to shine light on it. And in the fall, when we knock on wood, have some more and we're looking at more reinvestments, this one is at the top of my list. So, okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say yes. 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 All those opposed, say no. 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 The motion fails for, uh, fails. Other comments about the budget? We haven't heard from everybody yet. No? no. Okay. Well, then I will go ahead and, um, it, it, hang on, I'll, I'll get there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and make a couple of comments. One, um, I have been very pleased with the budget process that we went through this year. Um, eight months of discussing all of the different programs, uh, many of the different programs that are included in this budget, um, including deep dives into things like equity, uh, dual language immersion, ELL, uh, the fact that we're adding more teachers, we discussed that, counselors, early childhood, high school early response, restorative justice, career technical education, um, I think that the board did a lot of really, really hard work over the year to make sure that we informed the superintendent about the priorities that this board has and the kinds of funding that we were interested um, in seeing on those things. We did a lot of public, uh, we have public comment after every single one of those uh, items have come up. Um, we, I know Superintendent Smith, because I was reviewing uh, just the other day the your listening sessions that you did with the public on the budget, and those were very helpful to see those comments that were made by people. We had our own two listening sessions in addition, one of those being in Spanish, which I thought was great that we were able to um, do that for the Spanish-speaking people in our community. Um, and I also want to say that I, I've never been in a back room with anybody. Uh, all of my discussions that I have about the budget are right here in front of everybody. Um, uh, so I'm not sure where Director Buell is seeing the back room, but I've never been in one. So with that, we'll go ahead and vote on resolution 4918. All those in favor, please this indicate. Is the, this is the budget itself. This, budget. Budget. this is the budget, yeah. Okay, thank you. 4918. We'll mm -hmm. so, so just to clarify, we have made absolutely no changes to what the superintendent brought forward as a board, right? No, not that I know of. Are you? There was the list that, that, that uh, Mr. Wynn had sent us about the changes that were different. Do you? Did you see that? Uh, <sighs> Director yeah, Wine, I would you like was, to come forward and yeah. list the changes that we've made in the budget for us? The, did you, we, do you need that? We did not make those changes. Right. We were and told they, they came from that the they were being made. Right. <laughs> Which well, is very frustrating. This is the budget that we have been talking about for nine months, so no, I wouldn't expect some, there to there be very There were some changes first. sent to us yesterday, which I think the public should know about. Yes. So right. it would so be So Director Wine, would you like to come and forward? this board did not discuss those. Yeah. They were just, yeah. we were just told oh. that they were being added. Here's your opportunity. So. Thank you Put for bringing nose. it up. Members of the Board, Superintendent Smith, David Wine, Deputy CFO and Budget Director. So as part of your packet for this meeting, there was a memo confirming a few changes from the proposed budget document. A couple of those are technical adjustments. As the budget team is finalizing the, um, the approved budget, uh, checking on various things, there were two things that came to light that were not uh, included in the proposed budget. One of those was um, the decision to use, uh, take advantage of the provision in the contract with the teachers to have an extended school year for next year. Um, the application of those two additional days for employees who work 200 days, as an oversight that was not included in the proposed budget, it's in the approved budget. And then when it came to athletics, the uh, decision in October to add money, $900,000 to the budget for the current year was part of a full year uh, $1.5 million cost for doing those things. And in the proposed budget, we added 500,000. We really needed to add 600,000 to fulfill that full year commitment. So those two things are changed in the approved budget from the proposed budget. In addition, the superintendent also adjusted the proposed budget to provide additional support in two uh, key areas. 
One is provide support, mentoring, coaching, and supervision of principals. So there's an additional regional administrator position in the approved budget. And there's also an additional position in, in human resources to further support new hires and training district-wide. So those four things together um, change the total expenditures in the approved budget from the proposed budget by $604,000, and they're funded by a reduction in operating contingency. So in the approved budget, contingency is at 3.9% of total expenditures in comparison to 4% in the proposed budget. Director Regan. So for my colleagues who didn't want to add anything, because this is just the way it was, um, it just seems a little hypocritical, so I just want to point that out. Well, I saw that, those changes, Bobby, so I don't feel I'm being a hypocrite at all. Director B Belisle? Um, I, I'm sorry if I was un unclear about why I wasn't supporting the amendment. Um, I, I don't recall my saying that I didn't want to change anything just because. I, I thought that there were competing interests. Right. Um, and so I felt like the budget that was submitted um, was actually a good balancing act. So it wasn't because I thought it was too late. It wasn't because I just think the budget is what it is. Um, it's, it's because there are many competing interests, and I think this strikes a balance. And I think we'll have an opportunity to do a budget amendment similar that we did this fall if tax, um, tax revenues increase. Well, I'm just saying we're adding, we're adding at the last minute two positions, which we really didn't have any discussion about, um, and apparently that's okay, so there's a contradiction. Director Buell, do you have a comment? One of the positions, uh, Superintendent Smith, is that is one of a, a, a new regional director that's over the, that's over the uh, principals. principals supervisors principal could you just explain yeah. what's happening there yes. I my assumption is see if this assumption is correct is that that's some sort of response to mr. curler's comments in the past year it's a response to much of the dialogue we've been having about um, how do, are we providing principals maximum support so right now our regional administrators uh, support anywhere from I'm going to say it's 14 to 22 or 23 principals each, depending on how many clusters you supervise. Um, what at the addition of one more regional administrator does is it brings it down to, I think it's 14 to 17, so the range is much is smaller. And my hope is that by next year we actually have a single regional administrator to a single cluster so that you really have a, a regional administrator who's identical, well, pre-K-12, so it is, yeah, so we have pre-K-12, so they've, they're supervising all. So one of the things we're doing this next year is we'll have it, um, the high schools won't be a separate um, regional administrator. Each one of the regional administrators will have a geographic cluster pre-K-12, uh, and they'll have between 14 and 17 schools. So it, it allows us to give more um, intentional support to our principals, which has been the, one of the concerns and conversations this year. Uh, I'm smiling because intentional was the word they used about 500 times I know, at, the, I, at the OAIB at the <laughs> last week. Yeah. And I'm going more intentional. And they must have, I wrote a whole piece on it that goes out to Oregon State Our School's unintentional lap about well, my, I'm, I'm going to just yeah. share a concern about adding that person. Mm -hmm. We have, marvel we have just a lot of really marvelous principles, mm -hmm. but I also get story after story after story of ones who are jerks and who are nasty to their teachers. And I hope, I'm, and, and I get story after story after story. I'm not talking a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a, I get a lot. I had one last night, had one the day before, had one in the email the day before too. And, and if we're going to have somebody go out in this regional way and supervise them that's like the first thing we should tell them you know we don't want you being a jerk and we don't want you being a bully with the teachers that you have we want you to work with them because we've got principals out there that I keep getting report after report after report of them bullying teachers and acting like jerks I, I get it all the time all the time and so I just like to say, if we're going to add somebody, it doesn't do any good to add somebody unless we have somebody who begins to change those particular principles out of use. Because we have lots of wonderful principles. Mm -hmm. But we also have, I think, an awful lot of stories beyond anywhere what we should have. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Okay. 
Any other comments? Uh, Director yeah, Carlin. Yeah, I have a question. Well, d uh, first, the comment of uh, organizing in clusters, I think, makes total sense and fair to support that. Um, Jewish stuff. And, uh, but um, last meeting, we, we talked about the 360, and you were going to come back and say wh whether that's there's room in the budget to get that done or not. And so I'm curious to know what the answer to that is. And I just actually gave you the answer last time that there was not a specific funding of like a 360 process beyond the Indistar that we're looking at. But you said you're going to come back. Come back and, and tell you what's in the Indistar. No. Well, anyway, so now you're telling me that it's not. There's not. Well, there's not a specific funding for the for a. 360 beyond what the school improvement tool is that we're using, which is the Indistar that has an element of a 360 in it. Um, would that still would be ours to create a school climate survey or something like that? No, and there is not something in the budget at this moment. So we, so, okay, because I mean, we, we did make that a priority as a board. And, yes. And so how are we gonna get that done? It's a good question. Yeah, no, and it's not, there's not something in the budget at this moment for that. Other comments? I, and I would just, Dr. I guess, Atkins? just suggest, I mean, that, that, that again, every year and every summer as we consider our goals and priorities for the coming year, there's always the unfinished, what did we not accomplish? What, what, what were we not able to fund? So we just need to revisit that and, and, and keep looking at it. Yeah, so I mean, I guess I'll be looking at, at coming back and visiting this issue sure. pr prior to our next budget, because I, th I think there's, yeah. yeah. Any other comments? Okay, the board will now vote on resolution 4918, which is the budget. All in favor, please well, indicate. Well, remember, I, I know, I know, okay. I'm going to. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. Yes. All opposed, please say no. No. Are there any abstentions? Okay, we'll now do a roll call. Director Atkins? Yes. Director Regan? Yes. Director Blyle? Yes. Director Buell? I just want to make sure that they know that we're rubber stamping this up here today. And uh, oh, I think the reasons I'm, no. that's what I'm, yeah, I'm voting no. That was I'm mine. Yes. There you go. Director Kirk. I like it. Yes. Thank you. And Student Representative Davidson? Yes. Okay, we have a vote of Five, five to one with student representative Davidson voting yes as well. Okay, I'll now entertain a motion to adjourn the board as the budget committee and call the board back into its regular session. So moved. And a second? Second. Second. All those in favor, please say yes. 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 All those opposed? Okay, back into regular session. The board will now consider the remaining items on the business agenda, having already voted on 4914, 4916, 4917, and 4918. Ms. Houston, are there any changes to the business agenda? No, there's not. Do I have a motion and second to adopt the business agenda? So moved. So moved. A second, please. Second. Director Atkins moves and Director, excuse me, Director Belial seconds the adoption of the business agenda. Ms. Houston, any public comment? No. No. Is there any board discussion? No Director Buell. Uh, on the new contracts under. Sorry, can you read this smaller print? Under district wide 750, 750 Chromebook computers. Now, I'm not familiar with Chromebook. Like a is it a laptop computer? Yes. And these are for yes. what? And what, what use are these? What use are we going to make of the 750? Are we? Uh, are, are these ones to do uh, to, to, to do testing within the so within a school? And you have a cart and you run it around. Or are these ones for teachers? Or who are the 750 for, sir? Well, well uh, my name is Brian Morales. I'm director of technical operations. Uh, so, in a nutshell, a Chromebook is a, like a netbook type computer, so it's a small device similar to this one, that uh, runs on what's called the Chromium operating system, which is Google's ecosystem, right. so it's aligned with, um, if you've heard of Google Apps for Education, that kind of an environment. Uh, it's basically a, a laptop, fully-fledged laptop computer that's capable of running um, 
pretty much anything that is browser-based or app-based within the Google ecosystem itself. It's something that we've seen quite a bit of adoption uh, at our in like the K through six, K through eight space for uh, SBAC compliance for one-to-one um, -one initiatives. So you have uh, some some schools out here in our district right now that are already using that device. In what do one you to three. describe as one-to-one -one initiative? Um, what, 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 could you give me an example? One to one, one or one to two, one to three, one to four patterns where you take a device, put it with a group of students, and they use that device for, let's say, research or consuming media or working on a presentation or, in some cases, completing assessment material. So what this uh, item is is a purchase of 750 of those to add to our district fleet. Uh, this, this is coming out of IT funds to um, prepare for a refresh next year of student uh, and, and staff technology. And student and staff what? Student and staff technology. So these these devices would be purchased into IT and then they would be part of a district-wide refresh policy that we're working on developing. So you, these are being used to put back in place of ones that are, are no longer working? Correct, in places where I we mean, don't have a student-to-computer uh, student ratio sufficient for, let's say, smarter balanced assessment testing. Now, do you take them, uh, so if I had, how, what, what's, what's the metrics you would use on where you would put them? Well, this uh, particular set of Chromebooks. You see what I'm saying? I mean, yes. how, how do you decide where they go, would go? Well, there's a variety of metrics that you would use. Um, this particular set is intended for teacher use at this time. So this would be an augment of a larger refresh strategy to provide teachers with t the same tool that the students are using in working on, let's say, the SBAC assessment or in a student device-based uh, education scenario. The metrics that we've been using for um, technology disbursement in the district at this point have been a combination of combined underserved and student to computer ratio. So we're basically taking the combined underserved percentile, lining that up, and then looking at what our uh, student computing lab resources look like, and then building a, um, basically a matrix off of that. that. That work is still in flight. We're still in the process of designing that plan as we've been awaiting the budget approval uh, for you know, to understand what our refresh cycle is going to look like next year. But what's the, the relationship of this in our computer labs? Because this, like we close we close down the computer labs for weeks on end in in many many schools for testing. Mm -hmm. So what's the relationship between this and the computer lab? So if I'm a teacher and I get this, can I? Uh, is there are there other? Would I be in a school maybe where there's all the children in my class would have one and we're not using those for testing? In other words, could it, it, do you get a full 180 days out of this, so to speak? Not this particular five. line item, but this as a concept, yes. Is going to I guess I can. Going to These teachers. are going to the teachers, but theoretically. So other, the teacher might have this, but the kids may not? Well, I think part of our strategy is to, to answer that with a no. The teacher would have this, and the kids would have devices very similar as we move forward with our technology. For our so what's the relationship between those devices the kids have and the closing of the... Of the uh, computer labs? It really depends. If, if, are you speaking directly to SBAC and like Pretty the, much, the state yeah. assessment? So I think it's going to be up to the buildings and the individual administrators. So as an example, we're currently going through a field test of the SBAC mm -hmm. assessment mm -hmm. where we're looking at what does it mean to do that assessment in a classroom setting as opposed to a lab setting. In order to enable that classroom setting, you're right, you need devices like this in the hands of students. So we're thinking about Enabling that us to do that in a classroom setting versus a lab setting. Yes. On the SBAC, is that because we're short of labs, or because we're? It, it partially, I think, has to do with the pedagogy behind night, it. I mean, it's I'm not an assessment expert by any means, um, but the conversations that we've been having have been focused around the the pedagogy behind delivering that assessment in a classroom setting where the student is familiar as opposed to taking them out and occupying a lab for a very extended period of time, which is a, a limited use environment. It's also an environment that, you know, to be quite honest, has other instructional use, whereas those kids are already in that classroom, and perhaps we find a way to empower them and their teacher at the same time. That's a great idea. Thank you very much for sharing that. By the way, 70% of them are going to fail anyhow, so I'm not sure we have any pedagogical worries about trying to get them in some sort of better setting, because they're going under anyway. I mean, it's happened all over the country, so. 
Like so, that. thank you. Any other discussion on the business agenda? No? Board will now vote on the business agenda. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, please indicate by saying no. Any abstentions? The business agenda is approved by a vote of six to zero with student representative Davidson voting. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much to, um, oops, Director Belisle. Before we adjourn, I just wanted to acknowledge that today was a historic day um, in our state of Oregon. Um, and I just want to, I just want to congratulate um, the fact that equality has finally come to those people who are in love, regardless of people's philosophical or religious beliefs. Um, I appreciate that the courts have finally decided that um, marriage is a civil right, and to all of our staff, to all of our families, to all of our community members, um, congratulations, our and um, I celebrate with you today, and I am sure that we do Absolutely. this award as well. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, the next meeting of the board will be on Tuesday, uh, this says May, but I, May 27th, but at 7.30 p.m. This meeting is adjourned. All right.